Thank you. Please be seated. Be on the record, this is case CR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. Mr. Daybell is here represented by counsel, Mr. Pryor. Uh, the state is here today with their prosecutors, I believe. Um, Ms. Smith, are you making argument today on the case? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Rachel Smith will be providing argument. This is the time scheduled on a motion hearing. Uh, in this case, there was a order of the court that was uh, entered in regards to the location for the trial in this matter, which the court determined would be in Ada County. Thereafter, the court uh, requested additional time to present information on a request to sequester a jury and transport them to Fremont County under Idaho Code 1918-16. Matter has been set for hearing on multiple occasions and continued and is now scheduled for hearing today. So uh, at this time then, I'll ask the parties if they're ready to proceed. Ms. Smith, are you ready to proceed on your motion? And we'll style this as uh, a motion to reconsider the court's decision. Are you ready to proceed with argument? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Pryor, are you ready to proceed? Judge, just as a preliminary matter, uh, the state provided me uh, uh, modified numbers as of uh, 748 last night by email. Obviously, I didn't get an opportunity to review those. We are ready to proceed, but I want to make a record that at this time, the numbers on the exhibit that were originally provided to me have now been changed, um, and that new numbers are being uh, presented to this court. And, and uh, I just want to make clear that I didn't get those until uh, 10 minutes before 8 last night by email and looked at those this morning. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Well, consider that in the context of the hearing. Uh, for those that are in attendance of the hearing today, I'll just note that we did issue an order governing courtroom conduct and that will be in effect and enforced. So um, cell phones are to be turned off during these proceedings. If we hear a cell phone uh, go off, then expect it to be confiscated pursuant to the court's order. Uh, we just needed to have that to maintain order in the court as we've transitioned from being remote on Zoom hearings, going back to in-person live hearings, I've just noticed a pattern of cell phones going off in courtroom proceedings, which I've experienced as late as yesterday during court proceedings. And so in order to maintain order, uh, we found it necessary to have that restriction in place. And I appreciate everyone in complying with that. So at this time, 
uh, we'll also advise those people that are here uh, in the hearing that when the hearing is concluded, please remain seated uh, until Mr. Daybell, the defendant's been escorted at the direction of the bailiffs in charge of the courtroom and uh, don't leave the courtroom until you're advised by courthouse security here to do so. So at this time then, Ms. Smith, if you're ready to present argument in support of your motion, you can do so. You can either start with a opening statement if you'd like, or you may proceed with the calling of witnesses. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as a brief matter, the state would just um, outline what we expect the evidence in the state's argument to be. Um, as a preliminary matter, your, thank you for the opportunity to allow the state to present the economic impact on Fremont and Madison County for a change of venue in um, Ada County. Um, the statute um, Idaho, under Idaho Code 19-1816, the court is allowed, and I, I know the court's well aware, that you are allowed to consider whether it's more economical to transport the jury to the county of origin than to try the entire case in Ada. And the state today is going to present four witnesses to you which give you information that allows you to um, consider transporting the jury from Ada to Fremont County. We recognize and respect that the court has already established one part of Idaho Code 19-1816, which the court has found that a fair jury cannot be found in Fremont County. While the state respectfully disagrees, we understand the court's position. We are asking you now then to balance the interest of the defendant in a fair trial, and you've done that. You've decided that a jury in Ada would be better equipped to hear and consider the evidence. Now we're asking you to bear, balance the state's interest in um, a proceeding with fiscal responsibility, to proceed with the opportunity to have the case in the jurisdiction where the crimes occur. And the state's position is the defendant picked venue when the bodies were hidden on his property and when he killed Tammy Daybell. And because of that, the case should be tried in that jurisdiction. You will hear from the people responsible for trying the case here, for helping the court administer justice, that they believe they can accomplish both the goal of giving the defendant a fair trial and allowing the citizens of Fremont access to the cases in their jurisdiction and allow the taxpayers in Fremont and Madison County to save money. You will hear from Abby Mace, the clerk for Fremont County, who is responsible for budgeting for things like the um, jury sequestration cost, the cost of the court clerk. You will hear from Lieutenant Ruby, who is a witness from Ada County about what cost Ada County will absorb and what costs they will pass on to Fremont County and what experience, um, if any, Ada County has with dealing with sequestered juries and or transported juries. Then you will hear from Chief Terman, who will discuss the number of witnesses that if the case gets completely transferred to Ada County, will have to um, travel to and or stay in Boise. Um, those numbers you will hear are pretty substantial. Then you will hear from Sheriff Humphreys about his office's ability to handle the manor and what he has to do to budget to handle a case um, either in Fremont County or in Ada County. And as a preliminary matter, I'm gonna ask the court to take judicial notice of Mr. Daybell's court file. And specifically, I'm gonna ask you to take judicial notice of the state's first res discovery response provided to the defense counsel August 12th of 2021. In there, there is an addendum B. Addendum B is the list of witnesses. And on that list of witnesses, the state outlined that there are a, a proposed 104 witnesses. That discovery response is a public document and has been reviewed by the witnesses in this case who can talk sort of with the court about the cost of getting people from Fremont or Rexburg, Fremont County or Rexburg to Ada. And that is a factor the court considers in terms of considering the economic impact. So that's uh, the state's position and sort of outline what we expect you to hear this morning. And at this point, if there's no questions from the court, I would like to call the Abby Mays. And Judge, I'd like to make a statement as well, given that she was given an opportunity to make a statement. I should be afforded the same courtesy. All right, you can make a statement, Mr. Pryor. I will note that on the request that the court take judicial notice of those pleadings contained in the file, the court will take notice of those pleadings in terms of the 
issue before the court for today for that limited purpose. So, Mr. Pryor, what's your statement? Judge, I want to uh, uh, make note of the fact that the court issued a memorandum of decision, a well thought, thought through memorandum of decision. And I would ask the court to strongly consider that memorandum of decision when you make a decision in this matter. Uh, from my perspective, Judge, this is just a motion to reconsider. That's all it is, and we shouldn't be having that hearing. Uh, I disagree uh, with counsel. The court made the decision already. The court made a decision that venue is going to be in Ada County. The court in its memorandum made a decision that the jury would be selected in Ada County, and the court has not yet made a decision as to whether or not in Ada County, when we have our jury trial in Ada County, that whether or not the jury is going to be sequestered. Now, by issuing a, a decision in this case that grants the relief the state is seeking, in essence, you've just sequestered the jury. It's cut because I can't think of any circumstance where you're going to bring a jury over from Ada County after picking them for two, maybe three weeks in Boise, bring them over here and have a eight to 10 week trial, and they're not going to be allowed or, or permitted to walk freely around the community. They're going to be sequestered in a hotel. And at that point, Judge, uh, you have made a decision in a backhanded way that this uh, jury is going to be sequestered. Now, in regards to their, their motion to, uh, to, to have the court balance the case as it relates to Mr. Daybell's right to a fair trial, and whether or not this is going to cost Fremont County uh, some money, there's no issue there, Judge, because Mr. Daybell is absolutely entitled to a fair and impartial trial. And I'd ask the court to go back and look at its memorandum decision and the way it talked about some of the instances, instances and events that took place in this county in Madison County. And it's not a matter of balancing, Judge. The court can consider the cost, may consider the cost, but that's not the overriding consideration. That's not the consideration that the court uses as its primary consideration as to where to hold this trial. And that decision has already been made. The decision has been submitted to the Idaho Supreme Court. It's a done deal. And for them to come back and do this, uh, I think is clearly inappropriate. And I consider it a motion to reconsider. And we shouldn't even be having this hearing. We shouldn't even be presenting this. They had an opportunity to do that many, many months ago. And now they're here grandstanding and saying, guess what? These are all the numbers that we're going to use. And unfortunately, the numbers keep decreasing as we get closer to the hearing, right up until 7.48 last night, when the numbers came down dramatically again. And I shouldn't even be put through this thing, because the consideration is whether Chad gets a fair trial. And he's entitled to a fair trial above anything else. And I would ask the court to dismiss this at right now. We shouldn't be going through this. It's a motion to reconsider, and I'm seeking a dismissal right now. All right, and considered your motion there, Mr. Pryor, in context of your argument also. Uh, I will note, I just got a note from the court clerk here that in order to adequately pick things up during this hearing because of the acoustics of this courtroom, I'd ask that counsel remain seated during argument. Speak into your microphones because we'll make a better record. So I want to address a couple of points that were raised there. First, uh, it is true the court issued a decision on October 8th, 2021. And in that, I considered uh, not only the transport of the jury request made by the state under the code we've mentioned, but also uh, would note the state had previously filed a separate motion to sequester the jury. That was filed on September 29th. In the order that was issued, I'll just read what the order stated that says, for the reasons stated below, the court denies the request to transport the jury from another county to Fremont County and will reserve ruling on the motion to sequester until such motion can be heard. Now the motion to sequester has not been noticed for hearing and is not the specific motion being heard today, although as Mr. Pryor's indicated, I think it comes into consideration when determining how this case will be tried, when and where it will be tried. In the context of when this order was issued, uh, the court did in a subsequent hearing discuss this issue and I think I left the door open for further consideration of this issue for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, the trial either had not been set out or was set out so far in the distance that 
Uh, I thought any numbers we were looking at could conceivably change. And uh, given what's happened with a lot of costs, in fact, gas, et cetera, since that time certainly uh, does change and factor into where we're at. Secondly, at the time we were operating under uh, COVID restrictions, there were questions about how trials could even be conducted, whether we had to have social distancing, whether we had to wear masks. Uh, those were all things that were evolving pretty much on a week-to-week -week basis by administrative orders. And so for that reason, I also thought that the timing of considering this with the trial set where it was is something that I would allow the state to present further argument on if they wanted to present further argument. So for those reasons, Mr. Pryor, motion to dismiss the state's motion at this time is denied. And I am gonna consider uh, that. However, now that the trial is set, we're in proximity to when that's going to happen. Uh, I think this is the time when the state needs to present whatever evidence it's got in support of this argument. Uh, the court does need to make this determination so that all parties are prepared as well as any facilities we're going to be using to conduct this trial. And so today's the day for presentation of evidence, and I will allow it to go forward. So on that basis then, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to call your first witness, you may. And then I'd ask counsel to speak into the microphones to make sure we make a record of this proceeding. Thank you, under the state will call Abby Mace, who is appearing um, by Zoom. The parties have stipulated that a couple of witnesses may appear by Zoom, and the court has entered that order. Um, Ma'am, Ms. Mace? Yes. Your Honor, may I proceed? She'll need to be placed under oath. I wanted to make sure, Ms. Mace, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, and when Ms. Smith was just talking, you hear her as well? Yes. All right, if you'd uh, please raise your right hand, I'll have you placed under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the pending cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. All right, thank you, Ms. Mace. Ms. Smith, you can inquire. Thank you. Ma'am, um, if you could state your name and your occupation for the record. My name is Abby Mace, and I am the Fremont County Clerk. And what are the responsibilities of the Fremont County Clerk? As the Fremont County Clerk, um, one of my main responsibilities is the budget officer for the county to make sure that um, the county stays in good fiscal um, responsibilities and also oversee the courts. When you say oversee the courts, specifically who do you oversee? Court clerks, excuse me. No, no problem. And um, does uh, your budgetary responsibilities, does that include um, the budget for the court clerks? Yes, it does. All right. And um, what other responsibilities do you have, just briefly? Um, I'm also um, the auditor and recorder and um, uh, over elections, indigent. Um, I wear several hats, clerk to the commissioners. And is your position an elected position? Yes, it is. Okay, when were you elected? Uh, I was appointed in August of 2020. Okay. Uh, excuse me, yes, of, of 2000. We're in 2020 now. A, a little bit of difference. Um, yeah. So just so I'm clear, you were appointed in 2000 and then you've stood for election since then. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, um, and part of your responsibilities, just so I'm clear, is to oversee the court clerks. Yes. All right. Now, in anticipation of today's hearing, did you review and research projected costs to Fremont County court system um, for the work done by the court clerks if the trial for Chad and Lori Daybell were to be completely moved to Ada County? Yes, I did. Um, and as part of your research and your review, did you work with the state to develop a, an exhibit for, that would aid you in your testimony? Yes. Okay. And did you help and help create this actual exhibit? Yes, I did. All right. And I have it marked as state's exhibit number four. Do you have a copy in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay. 
Um, and would using this exhibit aid you in explaining to the court um, your opinion, your findings, and your numbers? Yes. Your Honor, I'd, I'd move up for the admission of state's exhibit number four. Prior, any objection? Judge, I think there needs to be a little bit more foundation. I agree. If you'd lay some additional foundation. Um, as part of your research on um, doing the creating exhibit four, did you do research on the exact cost for things like housing? Yes, I did. Did you research the cost for um, housing of witnesses? Yeah. Or uh, of personnel, I'm sorry? Yes, I did. Did you research the cost for transportation and mileage for your personnel? Yes. Okay. Um, did you explore the cost that um, the court would have to do to pay for public defender services? Yes. Okay. And those would be parts of the exhibit, parts of those research and that those numbers would go into your determination of what budget request to make, correct? Correct. And parts of Exhibit 4 are um, items that you will need to use to submit for budget and findings, budget budgets and requests for budgetary compensation from the um, Fremont County Courts, uh, Fremont County Commissioners. Yes. And are each of the, is your research and your findings reflected in State's Exhibit 4? Yes, it is. I move for the admission of State's Exhibit 4. Judge, there's still insufficient foundation. Uh, it, it's very easy to suggest that there's numbers on this page. I have no information as to where these numbers came from, how she arrived at these numbers. And frankly, Judge, if these were given to her by somebody else, there's a clear foundation problem. And I think there's a clear foundation problem. She doesn't get to get up here and just say these are the numbers that I feel are, are appropriate in this case without the necessary foundation to establish where those numbers came from, how she arrived at those numbers, and who provided her to those numbers. So at this point, I object to this exhibit because there's still a clear problem with foundation. Your Honor. Mr. Pryor, I'm prepared to make a ruling. I think that goes to the credibility and weight of the evidence, but not the admissibility for purposes of this hearing. I do find there's sufficient foundations been laid the admission of state's exhibit four so the exhibit is admitted for purposes of this hearing thank you your honor um, ma'am turning to state's exhibit four um, did you uh, take efforts to figure out how to um, develop projected budget costs yes i did and what was your logic involved and i'm referring to the second page of the exhibit how did you figure out um, how to start? So um, to start with, I figured um, that because things change, um, I would use the federal government's uh, per diem rates um, to calculate the costs. And um, then for overtime, I calculated um, what it would cost uh, projected of an overtime rate for my court clerks. Um, I also contacted um, a transportation company in Boise and one in that services Southeast Idaho for transportation costs of a jury to and from courthouses. So um, that's how I came up. And I also visited with the Ada County clerk on the costs of utilizing their court clerks. So that I'm clear, um, you looked at the the rates of the rate difference from the federal government IRS rates, the difference between Ada County and Fremont County. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yes. You identified categories or types of costs and then researched each of those costs. Correct. Okay. And then you also looked at what the long-term functions of your office are and, and what the cost of those was. Correct? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Let's turn to the uh, third page of the exhibit. What per diem rates did you identify and where did you get those rates? Um, I went to the um, IRS and its website and on the federal per diem rates um, and that's where I found those rates. Um, for Fremont County, 
Um, the nightly rate for lodging is $96, and the meal per diem rate per day is $59. Um, in the uh, in Ada County, the lodging rate is $147 per night, and the food per diem rate is $74. Um, so that's how I came up with those rates. And then I used the reimbursement rate on mileage from there also. It, it is it currently at 58.5 cents per mile. Um, and that is, those are subject to change with the economy. So I felt like they were the most accurate that I could use at this time. Um, and I notice on state's exhibit four, under the per diem rate for mileage for Fremont County, there's a not applicable. If the case were tried in Fremont County, would you be responsible for paying mileage to any of your personnel? I would not. But if it was transferred to Boise, you would? Yes. Okay. Um, did you sit down and calculate the distance from Fremont County to Boise, Idaho round trip? Yes, I did. Um, I used uh, Google Maps and calculated that from uh, Fremont County to Ada County is 740 miles round trip. And so that's the number I used in calculating the mileage per diem. Now, um, did you identify, turning to the next page in the exhibit, did you identify specific types of additional costs were the case to be moved to Ada County? Yes, um, like I said before, I visited with the Ada County clerk and visited with them on if we utilized Ada County clerks for the uh, to service the trial, um, what those costs would be. And he indicated that um, it would be approximately $25 an hour. Okay, um, um, let me ask you, what categories of costs did you identify? Um, I identified personnel, um, mileage, lodging, um, food, the meals, overtime, and um, added jury costs. And then I also calculated the costs for travel in those same categories for public defense, um, assuming that there would be two public defenders assigned to this case. And why would you calculate the cost for the public defense? Why would that be part of your job? That's because the county is responsible for the costs for paying for public defense. Um, turning to the next page in the exhibit, is the county also, to your knowledge, responsible for paying the cost for the prosecutors? Yes, they are. Do you, do you have any role in that, in determining the cost to the prosecutors? No, I do not. That is submitted by the prosecution to the commissioners and they review those costs. Okay. But are you aware of whether or not um, if the elected prosecutor, Lindsey Blake, and the deputy prosecutor, Tanya Rawlings, were in Boise, are they going to need a prosecutor here to keep the continuity of um, function moving forward? Yes, they would. Um, because um, we will still continue to hold court for um, other proceedings that are happening in our county. And so therefore, we would need additional help from them. And it would also put us short staffed if we use Fremont County court clerks um, over there that we would need to look at possibly uh, additional help there. Um, turning to the next page on court person uh, clerk personnel. Um, now, in terms of whether, who decides what clerks are going to cover the Daybell trial in Ada County? It's my assumption that the judge will make that determination. Okay. And so did you work with the Ada County clerk to help determine costs to aid the judge in making that decision? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, what are the anticipated costs if the court uses Ada County court clerks? If the court uses Ada County court clerks, I estimated that um, we would use two clerks and that for a 10 week trial, it would cost approximately $20,000 for their court services. 
I didn't know if there would be any overtime included, so I did not calculate any of that. Um, and I, I know there's a summary chart where you show your math at the end, but just briefly, how did you get to 20,000? Um, I times the $25 an hour um, times five days a week at eight hour days to come up with a $20,000. And what length of, of trial Sorry, did could you, you use? Could you repeat that again, Ms. Mace, that calculation? So I, I took the rate that he um, gave me of $25 a rate, $25 an hour per clerk. Um, and I times that out by um, a daily rate, and then I times it out by a 10 week trial. And I was calculating eight hour work days on that. Okay, thank you. Now, if um, the court needs the clerks um, who have handled the case in Fremont to go and try to handle the trial in Ada, um, can you walk us through your math on that? Yes. So, um, because they will be being paid their regular rate, I did not put their regular work rate in there. Um, but I did calculate that um, if they were able to come home on weekends, um, it's about a five hour drive from Boise to St. Anthony. And so I calculated that there would be uh, 20 hours per week of overtime for two clerks to be traveling over there. And so that's how I came up with the overtime rate. Uh, mileage, again, I used the um, Google Maps to come up with the, the miles from Fremont County to Ada County. And um, round trip, that's 740 miles. And um, lodging rate, I figured five days a week of lodging at the per diem rate. And meals, five days per week at the uh, per diem rate for the meals. And um, should the court choose to use the clerks who have been handling the case from Fremont County over in Ada, what is your projected budgetary cost? I project that if we used, um, excuse me, was that Fremont rates or, or Fremont clerks or Fremont Ada? Fremont clerks. Yeah. Fremont clerks would be $45,266 approximately. Now, turning to the next category of cost for public defense, um, and you've indicated that the court covers the cost for um, public defense, and it's your understanding that there are two public defenders assigned to Ms. Vallow Daybell's case, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and did you identify added costs were those attorneys um, required to try the case in Ada County? Yes, I did. Okay, and these would be costs that would not um, exist if the case were to be tried in Fremont County. Correct. Um, what were the, if you could walk us through your math and um, your logic for the cost, added cost for the public defenders to try the case in Ada County? So again, I did mileage rate from uh, Fremont County to Ada County um, being 740 miles per week or two attorneys um, would be $8,658. Um, the lodging would be at $147 per day for five days a week would be $14,700. For meals, um, five days a week at $74 a day would be uh, $7,400. And then I also um, visited with the Ada County clerk about if they had room for um, the office space for the public defenders and they indicated that they do not. And so um, I calculated that office space rental would be approximately $750 a month. And I did that for three months because I didn't know if we could get it on a partial month or not, and so that would be $22,500 for a total of $53,258 of additional costs for public defense that the county would bear. And, it, and it, forgive me, on the office space, I thought I heard you say $750 a month. I may have misheard it. Um, how much do you anticipate the office space would be? Excuse me, it would be $7,500 per month. And um, where did you come up with that number? Um, the 
um, prosecutor's office had done some research and had calculated that that was the rate that they found available in, in Ada County. And so I used that rate. I did not research that myself. Okay. I'm going to object at this point. I tried to be somewhat tolerant. I've let a couple of objections in regards to hearsay go through. I understand that she's putting foundation, but she's still deriving numbers from another source and using those numbers. And frankly, Judge, although I, I feel I've been somewhat patient, I'm, I'm going to object at this point to the admission of that information. Okay, as it relates to the office space calculation, I'll agree at this point with the objection that there's an inadequate foundation for me to consider that unless you want to see if there's any additional foundation. It was just essentially saying an unknown source, so I won't consider that unless you have some further foundation you can lay, Ms. Smith. Um, Ma'am, you just budgeted the same amount that the prosecutors were estimating? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm going to object again. Still foundation. It's sustained. Okay. Um, turning to the next place, did you take it, Paige, did you um, make an effort to um, do budget projections for the cost of a jury sequestration? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and what length of time did you um, um, look at um, for a jury to be sequestered? For eight weeks. Um, is that because you didn't include the amount of time to pick a jury? Correct. Okay. Um, if you can, um, where did you get the numbers uh, to calculate your budget projection for the cost of jury sequestration in Ada County? So um, I made the assumption that because um, of the, uh, the length of the trial that the judge may want to use more than the standard number of jurors. So I picked um, 18 jurors and then I, like I said, I calculated uh, transportation costs. Uh, I went online and uh, found that um, the transportation costs um, for um, busing in Ada County, um, we would need um, two out, about four hours a day and it was $145 uh, per hour that they charged. Um, so I calculated that out um, five days a week um, at four hours a day to be $31,600. Um, I'm sorry, for Ada County? Excuse me, no, excuse me, $145 a day would be 29,000. Excuse me, I was looking at the wrong numbers. Um, at 45, um, $145 an hour, four, four hours per day, approximately would be 29,000. The lodging rate for um, the jurors in Ada County um, at 147, $147 per day would be $185,220. And the meals at $74 a day would be $93,000. $240 for a total of $307,460. That's, that's the, your projected cost were the jury to be sequestered in Ada County? Correct. Okay. And did you research the same issue for a jury to be sequestered in Fremont County? Yes, I did. So I contacted our local um, uh, bus rental service um, and they would not do an hourly rate. They would only do a daily rate of $790 per day. So the cost would be $31,600 uh, for transportation for the jurors. Um, the lodging rate in Fremont County is $96 per day for a total of $96,768. And meals, um, the per diem rate is $59 a day for a total of $59,472 for a total cost of approximately $187,840. And that's for a jury sequestered in Fremont County? Correct. And the last page of exhibit four is that um, the chart you use to do your and reflect your math? 
Yes. Okay. Um, if you can um, just briefly walk us through each of the categories, and I notice it's color coded. So if you could just explain to the court, you know, the the color coding, um, or just put it on the record, please. Yes. So um, the the top in yellow is the cost of using Fremont County clerks to go over and clerk the the court case. Um, so the total cost, if we were to hold the trial in Ada County um, and um, use Fremont County clerks would be $379,355. Uh, in orange, um, if we were to hold the, the trial in Ada County and use Ada County clerks, I estimated the cost to be $354,089. And then in green, if we were to hold the trial in Fremont County and sequester the jury there, I estimated the cost to be $187,840. And this, none of this includes um, witnesses for the, the uh, defense because I had no way of determining what those would be at this point. So it, I'm sorry, I, I wanna make sure I could hear you. It does or does not include witnesses for the defense? It does not. Okay. Um, and when you say witnesses for the defense, you mean the public defense? Correct. Okay. And what? And will the um, court um, that you're responsible for and their budget be responsible for paying witness fees, transportation costs, lodging for def the witnesses um, endorsed or subpoenaed by the public defenders? Yes, we will. And you don't have any calculation for that? I do not. All right. Now, turning towards sort of the long-term staffing um, uh, and responsibilities of your um, team, are the court clerks from Fremont responsible for the long-term record on appeal in this case? Yes, they would be. Um, and so gonna, it would be Judge, my gonna, preference. Hold on, Ms. Mace. There's a pending objection. Go ahead, Mr. Pryor. She's going to um, excuse me, I cannot hear Mr. Pryor. All right. Well, he made an objection, so if you'll just wait for a minute, we need to rule on the objection. Mr. Pryor, what's your objection? Judge, at this point, the, the, the state is making the presumption that there's going to be, be an appeal. Are we going to spread, spread this thing out to that extent, that we're going to start considering those things? I, I think that's a little speculative, and at this point, I don't think it's appropriate for this proceeding. Well, issues related to appeal, I think that's certainly beyond the scope of what the court's willing to consider on this. So I'll uh, sustain the objection as irrelevant. Okay. Um, Ma'am, what are the functions of the court clerks in, um, in terms of rec record keeping? Um, my court clerks are to um, take all of the information that is presented and file it in, within the case and keep it in an organized and uh, manner and also to um, do the minute entries of all of the um, court proceedings so that we have a complete record uh, of the case. And so understanding that, has your um, team had experience with cases that were had a change of venue from Fremont to other counties? Judge, I don't understand the relevance of all of this. Again, we've talked about costs. Are we going to start going this I'll, I'll allow this to continue if you'll uh, draw it into the issue at hand, though, Ms. Smith, please. Thank you. Did you did you hear the question? Yes, I did. And yes, we have had uh, experience with a change of venue um, on trials in our county. And, and what is your experience um, with regards to the record keeping in the, the level of work needed for your team when cases have been a change of venue? Um, it has been very difficult to combine the, the work done in one county versus another county and make sure that the court case is stayed consistent and thorough. Um, having some records in one county and exhibits and some in another county, it makes it difficult to maintain a clear record of the case. And, um as um, your team and the court clerks in Fremont have managed this case for a length of time, correct? 
Yes, we have. And do you have an opinion to offer the court on whether or not they should stay with the case um, were it to be tried in Ada County? I can object at this point, uh, allowing this witness to offer her opinion as to where she would prefer. She's the clerk. Or that wasn't the question, Your Honor. Yeah, it's overruled, Mr. Pryor. You can continue, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Did you understand the question, ma'am? Yes, uh, it's my understanding that you're asking me um, if I feel um, it would be best to have the same clerks handling the court case. And in my estimation and my court clerks, we feel that um, that would be the best is to have the same clerk handle the case throughout. Regardless of where it's tried. Correct. Approach briefly, Your Honor. Yes. All right, Ms. Smith, do you have any further questions for the witness on direct? No, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Pryor, uh, you can cross-examine if you'd like. I'd ask you to speak directly into that microphone and make sure and confirm that the witness can hear you okay and go ahead and commence your cross. Good morning, Ms. Mace. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, if you have at any point difficulty hearing me, would you please? Uh, I'm struggling right now. Uh, I would like you to turn to the last page of your exhibit, if you would, for me, please. And let me know when you're there. I'm struggling still to hear Mr. Pryor. Would you turn to the last page of your um, exhibit and let me know when you're there? I'm there. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at two numbers at the bottom of the page. One is 354.89, and the other number is 187. Uh, Eight four zero, and you represented that that's the top number. The three hundred and fifty four is the cost of Ada County, correct? That is the cost if we use Ada County clerks. Okay, and the cost of one eighty seven is if uh, you use your own clerks, correct? And the court uh, the trial was handled in Fremont County. Okay. Okay. So do I understand it correctly? that if we were to pay for the, the county clerks from Fremont County to travel to Ada County to have a trial, the cost would be approximately 45,000 plus 266, is that correct? The 
total cost that I projected is the 379,355. Okay, okay. What I'm asking you, however, is that on the very top of the fourth page, you have projected costs of 45,200 or 266. Do you see that on the fourth page in yellow? Yes. What is that? That is the, that is the cost for uh, my court clerks to travel to Ada County to clerk the, the trial. Okay, and that's for the cost for the clerks to court, clerk the trial, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then we compare that to the orange, which is 20,000, correct? Correct. So if we were to uh, break this down, and I'll, I'll do this throughout my cross-examination, please be patient with me. Uh, my understanding is that if we were to just use the Ada County clerks, it would cost $20,000, correct? Correct. But if we were to just pay for the mileage for the clerks to travel to and from Fremont County for you to use your own clerks, it would cost 45,000 plus, is that correct? That's mileage plus lodging and, and meals okay. and overtime. So it would cost an additional $25,000 to use the, the clerks for uh, Fremont County as opposed to using the clerks uh, in Ada County, is that correct? That's correct. So there would be a savings of $25,000 by just using Ada County clerks. Is that a fair assessment, ma'am? If you're looking just at the numbers, yes. Right, okay. okay. Now, I noticed you made a notation about the Capital Crimes Defense Fund, and part of your calculations were lodging and other items in Ada County, if the trial were to be conducted in Ada County, includes costs of the public defender, correct? Yes, it does. Right, and in the Capital Funds Defense, uh, in the Capital Funds uh, uh, that are available, isn't it true, ma'am, that you can submit costs to the Capital Crimes Defense Fund and cover two public defenders, and all of the costs associated with those would be paid out of the Capital Crimes Defense Fund. Isn't that correct? That is not correct. It's my understanding that the Capital Crimes Defense Fund will pay for one attorney, and the county would be responsible for all the expenses of the other attorney. Okay. okay. And um, your cost of the lodging in Ada County of $185,220, would you be a little more detailed into, does that include, does that include the, the uh, sequestering the jury in Ada County? Yes, it does. Okay. Are you aware that this judge hasn't made a decision as to whether or not to sequester the jury in Ada County? That's correct. I have not, I, he has not. Um, my. I just wanted to have apples to apples, so I used sequestering in both locations. Okay. So why don't you tell me then, what's the cost if we don't sequester the jury in Ada County? What items are removed from your calculation? Uh, the lodging and transportation would be removed. So on the Ada County costs, if we were to just use, and the meals, would they not? Uh, depending on what the courts determine, um, a lot of times in a trial, we will provide um, the food for the defend or for the jury so that they do not have to leave the courthouse. So I put it in there because I determined that that would be. Um, there would also be um, mileage that the jurors would receive um, from their homes to the Ada County Courthouse that um, they would um, be reimbursed at that same federal rate um, is what Fremont County uses. Okay, explain to me why uh, the meals in Ada County are 93,000 for these folks and the meals in Fremont County are only 59,000. I'm, I'm having some difficulty. Um, again, I was not sure how to do these calculations, so I felt the only fair way to do to use was to use the per diem rate that is established by the federal government for those two locations. Okay, so uh, let me ask you this. 
and, and, and as I ask each of these items, go through each of these items, if you would just respond, I would appreciate it. Uh, if we were to just use the Ada County clerks as opposed to using the Fremont County clerks, we would save to almost $25,000, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, if we decide not to sequester the jury in Ada County, we then would not have 185,000 for lodging, or the vast majority of the 185,000 for lodging. Is that correct? That is correct. If we were to not sequester the jury in Ada County, we would not have $93,000 in meals. Is that correct? That would be determined by the judge, not me. Okay. In other words, whether or not they want to feed them lunch or whether they want to give them breakfast before they show up or whether they want to give them dinner after they've been, after they've been listening to jury testimony or listening to testimony all day. Is that correct? That's correct. So if I were to bring a witness forward to say that it's, it's traditional uh, for them to just provide a lunchtime meal, would you, uh, would you view that as incorrect information or would you say that's entirely up to the judge what he decides to do? That would be up to the judge. Okay, so potentially we could save 90 some thousand dollars in meals by just not sequestering the jury in Ada County, is that correct? That would be up to the judge. But it would be correct if he decided not to sequester them, correct? Again, that would be up to the judge on the meals. And then the transportation as well, correct? Correct. So if we're looking at these numbers, um, the cost of bringing a jury over if versus sequestration and not sequestering the jury is significant, isn't it? Yes. In other words, if, if, we're if we're truly trying to look at what's in the best interest for Fremont County and being good stewards, very good stewards of our financial um, condition, you'd have to agree with me that if we're just looking at saving money, the fact of the matter is, is that if we don't sequester the jury in Ada County, we are saving the citizens of Fremont County a significant amount of money by just not sequestering the jury in Ada County. Isn't that correct? I'm struggling to hear Mr. Pryor. He keeps okay. coming in and out. Okay. Isn't it correct that it would be a significant savings for us to not sequester the jury in Ada County and have the trial in Ada County rather than sequestering them? Again, that would be a choice of the judge. Well, All I did was, was, was put the numbers together as if they were sequestered. Okay. All right. But you would agree with me that those numbers would be significantly lower if we didn't have to sequester a jury in Ada County. Isn't that correct? Yes. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Any redirect, Ms. Smith? Um, briefly, Your Honor. Um, Ma'am, you're aware that this is a capital murder case, correct? Yes, I am. Judge, I'm going to object. This is going beyond the scope. It May I finish, Your Honor? Overruled. Go ahead. And you are aware that by statute um, that a jury must be sequestered from after the case is submitted to them through and into any um, sentencing hearing, correct? Correct. And so therefore, the jury will have to be sequestered at some point. It's just a question of how long, correct? Correct. And so since they will have to be sequestered at some point, you went for the entire length of the trial so the judge had those numbers. Yes, I did. Right. Because we don't know how long they will be deliberating, so it would be difficult to calculate that number. Correct. Now, um, if there was the, the trial itself were um, the jury was picked in Ada County, and then transported back to Fremont County, would any of the costs for um, use of the clerks be incurred? It would not. In fact, all of these numbers we're talking about are what it would cost us to do the case in Ada. Correct? correct. So all of these numbers are added costs to Fremont County, correct? Yes. All right. I have nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. That will conclude. Did you have any further redirect based on that? If I could, Judge. You may just on, now, limit it to the scope of that redirect. You don't, you don't know how long it's going to take a jury to, to deliberate in this case, correct? 
I do not. And you understand there's going to be some cost anytime you move a jury from one county to another. You would agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. All right, nothing else, Judge. All right, thank you for your appearance today, Ms. Mays, then that will conclude your testimony. Is there any objection to parties of her being excused from the hearing and logging off? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing, Judge, thank you. Okay, that'll conclude your attendance then, Ms. Mace. You can go ahead and log off of the Zoom meeting, and I'll ask the state to call their next witness. Um, the state will call Lieutenant Ruby, who is appearing by Zoom, um, pursuant to a stipulation between the parties. Very well. All right, Lieutenant Ruby, can you hear me okay? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, you're being called as a witness in this proceeding, so I'll have you placed under oath. Sir, if you would please raise your right hand, I'll have the clerk administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the pending cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you God? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. You can inquire. Thank you. Sir, could you state your name and occupation for the record, please? Uh, my name is Travis Ruby, R-U-B-Y. I'm a lieutenant for the Ada County Sheriff's Office in Boise, Idaho. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Uh, I've been with the Ada County Sheriff's Office since August of 2000. Um, I hold a um, master's certificate from Idaho Post. I also hold a supervisor certificate from Post. I have um, just over 3,400 uh, training hours, 3,478 training hours. Uh, throughout my career, I've been assigned uh, as a technician, as a jail deputy to, in the detention, as a patrol deputy, a school resource officer, uh, major crimes detective. Uh, I was a supervisor in our jail. I was a supervisor at our courthouse, and I'm currently uh, the lieutenant assigned to the courthouse as the chief of security. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your duties as the lieutenant in charge of courthouse security? Uh, so in my current role, I'm responsible uh, for managing three divisions, which is our court security division, our transport division, and our community transition center division. Uh, as the court security division, my responsibilities include ensuring uh, assignments of bailiff and court security deputies to courtrooms. Uh, to the court complex, to our juvenile court complex, and any annexes as determined by the court. As the uh, for the transport division, I am responsible for ensuring uh, the transport of inmates and the extradition of inmates from out of the area to Ada County. Um, the transport of inmates includes to and from the courthouse, also uh, to appointments or uh, medical appointments or other uh, court appearances. Uh, in which we've received a transport order as well. And um, have you been part of conversations about um, what Ada County would have to do in order to handle the Daybell trial in Ada County? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, and are you personally responsible for helping plan and, and give budgetary estimates for the cost to Ada County um, for the Daybell trial and for the Sheriff's Office? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how did you become involved? Uh, sometime in early March um, I, of this year, um, I was asked uh, about, or I was told about the potential of this, and I was asked uh, to look into what the scope of that would would include uh, for my divisions. Um, and so, how did you go about looking into the scope of it? Uh, I contacted our finance team, uh, our jail commander. Um, and to look into cost of housing inmates, uh, to the cost of uh, daily court functions um, under my purview, um, and then also try to identify what our sheriff would seek reimbursement for which services uh, and, and what that looked like. So when you say your sheriff seek reimbursement, um, what does that mean? Uh, any cost that uh, Sheriff Clifford would seek from um, the counties involved in the case uh, for the the tasks and the and the jobs that that our my team would perform uh, throughout the course of, of this proceeding. And so, just 
So I'm clear, Sheriff Clifford is the sheriff for Ada County? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, and seek reimbursement, Who? where would he seek reimbursement from, Fremont County? Uh, that's, yes. Okay, um, and were you able to identify what costs um, Ada County would seek reimbursement for from Fremont County? Yes, ma'am. Um, what were, what, if you could give us the cost category and the amount. Uh, so for housing an inmate, um, the sheriff would request $80 per day per inmate. Uh, and I, I got raw costs. I did not try to project how long this would take. I simply found what the costs are. Um, so for jail housing, it would be $80 per day per inmate. Um, for inmate movement to and from the jail to the courthouse, uh, that's, that falls under my daily responsibilities. So we do not intend to seek reimbursement for that. Um, for uh, bailiff functions and for court security functions, those fall under my daily responsibilities. And so the sheriff does not intend to seek reimbursement for that because I, I would have to provide staffing to a courtroom whether this trial is in Ada County or not. Um, for overtime, the sheriff would seek reimbursement. And I calculated, I, I worked with our finance team and asked them to calculate, I did not calculate, but I asked them to provide me the cost. Um, we call it a loaded cost, which would be um, the overtime rate plus um, benefits that the county would have to pay for any overtime. Uh, for a deputy, that comes out to $72 per hour. Uh, and for a sergeant, it would be $97.47 per hour. Again, I, didn't, I did not calculate or project um, how long this would take. The, my only projection is I, I do expect um, that if a jury was sequestered, uh, it would require um, at least three deputies on that detail any time they're not in the courthouse. Uh, and so for those rates, my, my expectation is that in general, uh, we'll be in the courthouse from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. So the overtime rate uh, would be anything after 5 p.m until 8 a.m. Uh, Monday through Friday, 24 hours on holidays and 24 hours on the weekends if, if we have to uh, uh, cover a sequestered jury. And those costs of overtime and sequestration coverage would be passed on to Fremont County? Yes. Okay. Um, are there other, um, did you explore what the cost would be and if it would be passed on to Fremont County from Ada County for things like a site visit to um, Fremont County? Uh, again, we would, we would have to plan that, um, but there would be uh, the cost, uh, if it's outside of normal business hours, um, again, if it's overtime rates, we would seek reimbursement for um, traveling uh, to and from Fremont County, um, if there's an overnight stay. Um, I, I did not talk to the sheriff about whether or not he would seek reimbursement if there's an over, overnight stay in another county. Should the state request and the court grant a site visit to um, the scene, um, you, right now you haven't figured out whether or not Ada County would pass that cost on to Fremont? Correct. Okay. Um, now, in the planning for the budget, do you in Ada County? Do you know whether or not your county commission is going to make the sheriff from Ada County um, bill Fremont County for the things that you plan to absorb? In my conversations, uh, my understanding is that uh, once the county commissioners have approved the budget and authorized it, it's the sheriff's responsibility to manage the budget. Um, as long as he's spending within the laws and statutes that dictate how public funds can be spent and he's following the rules of, of the county, they would not uh, force him to seek additional reimbursement. Okay. That, that's the typical practice. Okay. Um, now, you are also responsible for courthouse security, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, and so you have knowledge in terms of space and, and areas available, um, and you keep track of where people are within the building, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, to your knowledge, is there free or available space in Ada County for, say, the public defenders for Ms. Vallow? Judge, this is getting beyond the scope of this officer's uh, uh, not only experience, but to suggest now that we're going to 
ask a police officer who's, who's responsible for security to start talking about what the rental rates are for office space for a public defender? I'm not going there. Okay, well, it's premature objection. Uh, it's overruled at this point. You can continue, Ms. Smith. Yes. Um, so do you, you know who is in what space in the building you're responsible for, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you know if there's free available, uh, and maybe my word choice is what we threw counsel off, um, do you know if there's open or available space within the courthouse for um, the parties in the um, Daybell case? Well, I can't, I can't speak for other elected officials or department heads, but I, I have been in meetings and space is limited in within our courthouse. Um, it is, I've been in conversations with others who are uh, seeking additional space. Um, our public defenders did just have an expansion uh, to add space to their office area, um, which they're still um, filling and organizing. Um, and did you explore, um, you, you took myself and members of the prosecution team on a tour, correct? Or your team did? Lieutenant, can you hear me? Judge, maybe it's my mic, can he hear you? Uh, Mr. Ruby, can you hear? I can see the judge talking, but I can't hear anything. I've lost audio. Okay. Let's give it a moment, and if not, we may have to notify him somehow to re-log in and log off. Can you hear us? I'm, I'm not hearing anything right now, Your Honor. All right. Someone have a way to contact him? I do, Your Honor. All right. Why don't you see if he could, since it was working, probably just log off and log back in if he still has the Zoom meeting information. May I use my phone, Judge? I, no, I just yeah, for this purpose. Don't normally do that. Long off, long back, back on is is that acceptable, Your Honor? Yes. All right. I see the thumbs up, the nodding. I'll <laughs> I'll do my best to do this quickly. All right. All right, Lieutenant Ruby, can you hear me now? I, I don't. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I don't have any audio on my end. We can. Can you hear me? Um, unfortunately, I guess he's still not able to hear us. I don't know. Must be some audio issue on his end of things. Um. May I have a moment to call him? Just yes. Him. Yeah, why don't you do that if you want to step out for a moment or just see if you can reach him by cell phone and I'm not sure how to resolve that on his side. He's down the hall from his IT, so hopefully. May I go back to the judge? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. County Court Security, this is Lieutenant Ruby. How may I help you? <laughs> Lieutenant, we can hear you um, on your microphone. Okay. Is it?
try again here. Uh, Lieutenant Ruby, can you hear me now? You're on mute. And Judge, just checking this one, can you hear? So I'm going to suggest we take up another witness and then maybe in 15 or 20 minutes we can take a break and go back and see if we can conclude with uh, Lieutenant Ruby's testimony. Okay. And um, then the state will call uh, Chief Terman, please. All right. Chief Terman, if you'd please come forward then. I'll have you pause and raise your right hand. You'll be placed under oath and then you can be seated in the witness chair. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the pending cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right, thank you. You can be seated there, and then once he's situated, counsel, you can inquire. Um, Your Honor, do we want to take, make sure Lieutenant Ruby isn't, I don't care if he hears the testimony, but I wanted everybody aware he can probably hear us. Andy's Why don't you go ahead and just inquire, and then I don't, I don't know that it's a, a big issue if uh, he listens to the testimony of another witness okay. for this hearing. All right. I just wanted to record. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please identify yourself and state your occupation for the record? Yes. My name is Shane Terman, and I am the Chief of Police for the City of Rexburg, Idaho, in Madison County. Can you talk to us a little bit about your background, please? Uh, yes, I started my police career with the Rexburg Police Department in August of 1988. Uh, I was a patrol officer. I became a patrol supervisor. Um, I graduated from the post uh, basic academy. I currently hold an advanced certificate, law enforcement certificate through them. Um, I then uh, became a detective and worked in a number of years uh, in the detective division and then was promoted to a lieutenant over that division. Uh, I am also a graduate of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia in 2002. Uh, in 2010, I was appointed uh, to be the chief of police for the city of Rexburg. Um, and during your tenure as an officer with um, the Rexburg Police Department, were you ever a detective and aiding prosecutors in putting together trials? Uh, yes, I have. We have worked on uh, murder trials. Okay. And um, you also said that you're currently chief, and we see from your uniform um, the badge. So um, can you talk to us about what your responsibilities are as chief? Yeah. Uh, basically, it's the general overseeing of all of the department functions and activities, uh, staffing needs, uh, equipment needs, uh, cost expenses, preparing budgets, um, and uh, making sure that uh, we are providing the proper safety and uh, manpower to our community. Okay. And so part of the proper safety and manpower to your community, does that include supervising the detectives who work on murder cases? Yes, it is. Okay. And did you, in fact, um, supervise the detectives and lieutenants who worked on the investigation into the death of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell? Yes, I Ultimately, they reported to you. Ultimately, yes. Okay. Um, and are you also personally responsible for planning and budgeting the expense to your department for participating in the Daybell trial? Uh, yes, I am. In fact, and, we're in the budget process right now for this upcoming year. Okay. So you're in the midst of trying to figure out how much to ask for? Started. Our budget process starts in October, but we have to plan it now. Okay. And so as part of your planning for the budget, are you factoring in what it's going to cost your department for um, detectives and witnesses in the Daybell case to travel over to Ada should the trial be there? Yes. Okay. Um, and given your experience as a detective and now as chief supervising investigations, are you aware um, that the state itself will also have to pay for the witnesses in this case to travel um, over to the Daybell trial? Yes, I've been made aware of that. Okay. And um, did you look at the state's um, witness list that was a public document filed um, on or about August 6th of 2021 and see about 104 witnesses identified? Yes, I did. 
Okay, and that was part of the state's first supplemental response to discovery, correct? That's yes, my understanding. Yes, and you've looked at that document yourself? Yes, I have. And you've reviewed it with both the state and your detectives? Uh, yes. Okay, and um, did you work um, through and go through that list and determine sort of the length of time you would anticipate people would have to be in Ada County um, as witnesses in that case? Yes. Okay. And then once you knew how long they had to be there, were you able then to try to calculate and extrapolate costs? Yes. And will some of those costs, particularly the cost for your detectives, be part of the budget proposal you're putting together yes. for the city of Rexburg? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then um, after reviewing, or in the process of reviewing the state's anticipated witness list, and were several of your officers on that list as well? That's correct. Okay. And several of the people on there were people your officers had identified as witnesses, correct? Okay. Now, um, as part of um, reviewing that and putting together your budget production, did you also work with the state to determine anticipated costs to the city of Rexburg and to the prosecution? Yes. Okay. Um, just briefly talk to us. How did you do that? Uh, so, working with the, with the prosecution, what we did is we came up with um, what uh, the uh, types of costs would be were going to be to go to Ada County, what those rates of costs were going to be, uh, personnel and uh, witness witnesses that we were going to need, and then the length of uh, the trial and different lengths that some of those witnesses and staff may be. And then were you able to look at like your hourly rate or your overtime rate or the IRS per diem rate to calculate costs? Uh, so we just went with the uh, uh, GSA, so the General Service Administration and IRS uh, rates, um, which were $74 a day for per diem in Boise for meals. And then uh, the travel lodging was 147 And then uh, on the cost, for we took into account the parking, which is about $50 a week, so $10 a day uh, for those costs. So uh, for my officers and us, it would be $231 a day per person. Okay, so um, I'm hearing lots of numbers. So did you also, um, to aid you in your testimony um, before the court, work with the state to develop an exhibit to help you explain your logic and your math to the court? Yes, I did. Okay. and. Um, uh, and did that states exhibit three, correct? Yes. Okay. You know, at this time, I, I move for the admission of states exhibit three. And Judge, that's the same objection I made to the previous witness, is that there hasn't been a sufficient amount of foundation to determine where these numbers came from. I would object on the basis of foundation, Your Honor. All right. For purposes of admission of the exhibit, I'll overrule the objection at this time. I think there's an adequate foundation to have it admitted. Uh, so exhibit three is admitted. Okay, thank you. Now, um, Chief, just so that the record's clear, could you turn to the second page of state's exhibit three? And you've outlined sort of the, the logic you use, but just so that the record's clear, um, what, what costs or what logic did you use? So we had to identify what are the types of costs that we're going to, ex going to experience by going over to Ada County. Um, manpower, uh, travel costs, lodging, all that kind of stuff, and what the rate and for all of those costs were going to be per individual. And then uh, you know, how many staff members we're going to have to have in order to, uh, and witnesses, and so to apply those costs to each of those, and then determine the length of how long each of those witnesses may have to be uh, in Ada County. So why didn't you just say they all have to be there the whole time? Uh, well, we're trying to save <laughs> save money, and we're trying to get, uh, uh, you know, it, it makes it short on manpower for us, and so those that don't have to be there the whole time, I need them back at uh, my office so that uh, we can use them there. So not every witness has to be there every, all the time? No. Okay. And did you kind of determine based on sort of their role in the case or the evidence that they would have sort of categories of time that they would have to be there? That's correct. Okay. Now let's turn to the next page. Uh, let's talk about the cost types. 
then what cost types, and it, I see there's a typo in this, is it five cost types? What cost types are there? Uh, so there's lodging. Uh, there are, is per diem or the food cost each day. Um, and then there's also transportation costs and uh, staffing, uh, excuse me. So lodging food, um, st uh, lodging food, let me look here real quick, one more. Lodging, food, meals, transportation, and staffing needs. The cost, and then the fifth one was going to be the cost of the room for uh, prosecutors and our staff, but we haven't been able to determine that yet. So, and so you took that out? Yes. Okay, and then you also limited the transportation cost, correct? Yes, because uh, we just went with the uh, 58.5 cents per uh, mile, but uh, we're going to cover the cost of that, sending our officers over because they have to go over. Okay. And they have their own vehicles. Now, if you could, what's the per diem rate? I know you mentioned the GSA and the IRS amounts. That's on the next page. Is, are those the amounts that, we, that were identified as the IRS rates? Yes. And, and I just uh, looked those up again last night to see where they're at. And it's $74 per day for uh, per diem. It's $147 a night for lodging. Um, and then the travel costs are 58.5 cents per mile. Okay. Um, and so, um, but th that can change based on the economy, but that's what it is as of last night. Correct. Okay. And parking costs? Are about $50 a week, so $10 per day. Okay. And as of now, we don't have any evidence to say that Ada County is going to um, reimburse that. And nothing. Okay. So then what did you do next? So uh, in determining, uh, we determined kind of the length of stays uh, as I worked with the prosecutor's office on. Uh, well, can I back you up real quick? Did you figure out how much it costs per person to be there per day? Yes, yeah, so going off, the, off of that uh, daily rate, it was $231 per person. And what? And that's that next page on the exhibit you created. What What does that two hundred and thirty one dollars a day make up? That is the per diem, the meals and lodge, and the lodging, and then the ten dollars a day for parking. Okay. Those three items. For a, an a, an estimated amount of cost to the prosecution in Rexburg of two hundred and thirty one dollars a day per person. Yes. Okay. Now, how did you go about working and figuring out the length of stay? Uh, I worked closely with the prosecutor's office on those uh, officers and that witnesses that would need to be there for the full trial. Um, and they're esti just, it's estimated that it will last 10 weeks. Um, and so we figured that uh, $231 a day for those individuals, and we identified uh, 12 individuals uh, that would need to be there for 10 days. Okay, and in those 12 individuals, did you include the, the prosecution team, with the exception of myself? Yes. Because I'm a fixed cost no matter where it's tried. But that was for five, uh, five of the prosecution's team. Um, and then um, did, did you include in the, any of the numbers any of the witnesses from the FBI or other law enforcement um, in your calculations? Uh, no, I, we have. It's just uh, the law, our law enforcement and the prosecution team. Okay. And so anybody who was going to have to travel anyway, whether it's in Fremont or Ada, they're not in your calculations. Right. So these are just people who would have to travel if it's moved to Ada. Correct. Okay. Um, and then did you identify sort of three categories of link stays? Yes. Uh, ten, a 10 week stay, if, uh, a five week stay, and a one week stay. Okay, and just generally, what's the difference between those three? Uh, so for the 10 weeks day at $231 uh, per day for 12 witnesses, I believe that ended up being, uh, for each witness, $11,700 uh, and $75, I think. Um, well, let's, let me back you up just a little bit. Um, what sort of person would have to be there the length of the trial? Uh, so that would be four of my, well, five of my uh, detectives that are the main detectives on this case. Um, and then that's also uh, the staff, 
uh, from the prosecution's office that also has uh, three of the Fremont County deputies and uh, uh, Nicole Ur uh, Earl on there. Okay. And so um, why, now why would we have the main detective stay over in ADA? Well, it's been my experience in trials, uh, especially in a, when you're dealing with a homicide trial. You never know uh, when an officer is going to be called back in. Uh, for rebuttal, uh, they're also, they have to be there to confer with the uh, prosecutor's office on the case because they know the minute details and the in and outs of the case. And so uh, you, you never, it's not just a thing where they can, you can say, oh, we're just going to call them in for this one day because they may be called back at any given time. And, uh, and then along with that, like I said, uh, they are always there conferring with the prosecution team. And, and the custodian of, uh, um, of evidence, is that person yes. in there as well? Yes, I have, uh, I have one of the detectives that is an evidence custodian, and he has to be with that evidence for the whole time there to make sure that uh, chains of cut, the chain of custody is kept intact. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And then f the week, people in that sort of bucket of five weeks, what sort of person would have to be there for about half the trial? Um, so that is, I have another, uh, other detectives that uh, may not have, be the ones that work the full case, but have just a part of the case, um, but a, a substantial piece of the case uh, that would be in there for that. And, um, the reason they're staying, is it because of the distance from Boise to either Rexburg or St. Anthony? Yes, I, I can't expect them to drive back and forth okay. every day. And then people identified as one-week participants, what sort of person is that? Um, that would be more of the, uh, the state's uh, witnesses that are non-law enforcement that uh, have a part in this that uh, you've identified. Um, and then um, let's turn to the next page in your exhibit. You calculated a cost per person per length of stay. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to it, walk us through that? Okay, so um, starting with the, uh, let me go through the, the 10 week one. Uh, so we have 12 people for 10 weeks. Oh, can we just talk about the cost per person? Cost per person per day or per? Per length of stay, per length not of stay, a yes. total 12. Yeah, so for one person, for 10 weeks, it's $11,600 for uh, a person it, staying. Uh, can I stop you there? For 10 weeks, I'm looking at states. Five fifty. excuse me. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you off. $155, I think. Okay. Um, what about per person for five weeks? Uh, so one person for five weeks is $5,775 okay. per person for a week. And we're defining week as a work week, five days. Five days, basing that on a five-day week. Okay. And then what about a person who we need there for about a week? Uh, for a week, uh, that would be $1,155. It's just... Okay. And that does not include transportation costs, correct? That's just That's louding, food, and parking. That's just those three things. Um, and so then did you um, look at your staffing and the witness list and develop uh, an idea of how many people needed to be there for 10 weeks versus five weeks versus one week? So working with the prosecution, uh, we determined that we would need 12 people there for the 10 week period. We'd need three people there for the five week period and 35 people uh, for the one week period. And then did you sit down and calculate the cost in each of those categories for the full 10-week period? Yes, we did. Okay. What about the 10-week period for the individuals we need there the, the whole time? Uh, so for those 12 people, it would be uh, approximately $138,600. Okay. And what about the five-week cost for those three people? The five-week cost for those three people, I believe, was um, $5,000. Uh, Seven hundred and seventy-five dollars. Okay. Times three. Uh, oh, excuse me. Seven. It's seventeen thousand uh, three hundred and twenty-five dollars. I believe for those three. 
And what about the one week cost per person for the 35 people? Uh, for 35 people, that would be $40,425. Uh, okay. And so while the state has 104 people indoors, these are just the people that would have to travel um, in addition if the case were tried in ADA? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, were you able to assign trans transportation costs for all of the witnesses? Um, so, no, I was not, because I know the mileage going over, I, I was able to put the mileage from Rexburg, the boys who's 310 miles one way. Um, and so just, you know, going with the uh, GSA at 100, uh, or excuse me, 58.5 cents per mile was $181 one way, and so $362 two ways. Um, but because there were so many people involved who may be traveling in different ways, we didn't associate that per individual. That's correct, because okay. they're coming from all different directions. But if Rexburg or the Madison County of Fremont had to reimburse, this would be the reimbursement rate? Yes. Okay. okay. And then did you add up and come up with a summary of estimated costs? Yeah, uh, so again, uh, the total cost of those uh, three categories for uh, whole time that they would be over there uh, came out to one hundred ninety-six thousand uh, three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Three hundred and what? Fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Excuse me. No, that's all right. Um, now, um, if there is a change of venue to um, Ada County in its entirety. Um, how does that affect your manpower? Well, so, yeah, great. I have uh, seven detectives. And out of those seven detectives, I will have four of those that uh, will be over there for the 10-week period. I'll have one that uh, will be there for the five-week period. And I have a uh, sergeant that will be over there uh, for the um, a one-week period. Where it really hurts uh, our department is in the detectives. Uh, that leaves us with the two detectives um, that are going to have to cover uh, for at least five weeks everything that's happening uh, of any serious nature or crimes within when, within the city, and uh, that's a lot of burden put upon those detectives. And I know um, at one point someone suggested that maybe you could just hire or bring in reserve. Is that something you can do? Uh, not with the detectives, um, and the reason that is is because um, detectives are have experienced uh, a lot more training, specialized training, such as an interview and interrogation, crime scene uh, investigations, uh, things that are above and beyond just the normal patrol officers' uh, abilities to do, because um, they haven't been trained in that, and so. Uh, and you just, there's not reserve detectives. So we're, it puts us down to having the two detectives to try to cover all of that. Okay. And so do you anticipate a potential overtime cost? Um, absolutely. Okay, but you don't know what that's gonna be. I'm not gonna, I don't know what that's gonna be because I don't know what's gonna, what kind of crimes are gonna hit us within that 10 weeks. Well, hopefully none, but. Yeah. So far this year, it's been a crazy yeah, year. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm trying to be patient, but you know, we're going pretty far Is that an objection? Yes, it was an objection. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Smith, let's keep things moving along within the scope of the hearing, please. Um, just to be clear, the cost that you've given and outlined in um, state's exhibit three, none of those costs exist if the case is tried in Fremont or Madison County. That's correct. Um, and only some of those costs will exist if the jury is transported back um, for trial here. That's correct. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you, Erner. All right. Smith cross-examination, Mr. Pryor. Chief, can you hear me okay? Yes. Chief, you included in your cost estimates uh, the prosecuting attorney's cost as well, right? Uh, yes. 
You included the staff from the prosecuting attorney's office as part of that $138,600. Is that that's, correct? That's correct. Do you folks have separate bu budgets? Do we have separate budgets? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. So why are you including in your budget the prosecutor's costs? Um, I was asked uh, by the prosecution to help present this. Or well, in helping present this, you're including their costs in your costs, correct? Um, yes, we are. Okay, so how much are consulting with it? Hold on. We need one at a time. We have a court reporter here. Question, answer. Please don't talk at the same time. You can continue, Mr. Pryor. How much of that 138000 that you included as part of the prosecuting attorney's costs is included in your estimate? Well, if we just take the... Uh, I'd have to take... I'd have to get my calculator out, um, but it would be coming out of that $130,000 uh, dollar uh, ten week cost, right? Um, and so, if we we took that times five of them times the eleven thousand um, range, that t minus that, that's what would be the uh, their cost. And I can I can uh, pull my calculator out and do that if you would I like. You do that. But, uh, so what I understand then is. Uh, the prosecuting attorney in this case asked you to include their costs uh, when you came to testify today as part of the, the presentation to this judge. Is that right? That, that's correct. We okay. work together on that. And if I'm to understand you correctly, uh, you have 12 people that you're saying have to be there for the entire uh, 10 weeks. Is that right? That's what we're estimating, yes. And of those 10 people, five of them are the prosecuting attorneys and their staff, correct? That's correct. Did you include... Um, um, Ms. Smith's uh, cost no, involved? No, she was not included in that. Okay. Because she's been getting paid privately through one of the counties, right? Th that's my understanding. Right. Okay. So if I understand correctly, you're telling me that there are seven police officers that have to be present for the entire 10-week trial. Is that what you're telling me? That's what I'm telling you, yes. Okay. Now, you talked about your extensive trial experience in viewing murder trials, right? Yes. And, and you're suggesting that you have a lot of experience, right? Yeah, I have. Okay. In all of this, tr this extensive experience, how many of those trials did you require in Fremont County for the police officers to be there every single day? Uh, so my trials were all held in Madison County. Or Madison County, I apologize. Yeah, and uh, those officers that uh, on, on that the trials that I was on, we were there every day. Right. But they lived close by and they could leave. Oh, we, we, we lived in Rexburg, so. Right. And, and, and the judge is correct. I just please let me get my question out and I'll try to give you the same um, opportunity because sure. we will talk over again. We will talk over each other. So, um, <coughs> you agree with me that in terms of planning this trial, it's a big event, right? This is a, a very big event, yes. Right. And, and as a big event, we need to be careful and, and carefully uh, plan how each and every witness is going to be testifying in the 10 weeks of this trial. You would agree with that, right? I believe you have to, you have to try. Okay. Whether you can do that, I don't know. Okay. Because you don't have a lot of experience with that, right? Well, um, be, no, no, no. I'll withdraw. You don't have a lot of experience with that, is that correct? Objection. This has been asked and answered Over multiple times. Overall. You don't have a lot of experience with that, correct? Uh, no, I've got experience with that, and that is is that uh, you never know when you're going to get called back in. Okay. You have a lot of experience with an out-of-state trial in, an, in a, a county on the other side of the state? Um, no. Okay. So what, you don't, what, what you're suggesting then is just to be on the safe side, right, we are going to require seven witnesses to be there for the entire trial of 10 weeks, including the uh, two to three weeks for picking a jury. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I'm suggesting that uh, the prosecution has requested that those that are identified for the 10 weeks, they want them there for that 10 weeks. How, how often have your officers been involved in a three-week process of picking a jury? I don't think we've ever been in a three-week process. Right, so now we're down, if, if we pick a jury for two or three weeks, and I'll give you the benefit that it'll only take two weeks, I'm not sure yet, but we'll see. But if we take two weeks and we cut that out of the budget for your seven officers, because you agree that they don't need to be there for jury selection, right? 
Um, I don't know. They're, I believe that they're going to have to be there for jury selection. I, I was when I was in the trials because I consulted with the prosecutor. Oh, when you consulted with Can you do that by phone? What's that? You can do that by phone, right? Well, I don't think it's the same thing as being oh, in person. And I agree, it may not be the same thing, but having officers sit there for two weeks while a prosecuting attorney's office picks a jury, I, I'm not really following why we have to have seven police officers there who are witnesses in this case present while this prosecutor and I pick a jury. You would agree that seems to be a, a little excessive, correct? Uh, I don't know. That's going to be, I'm, I'm leaving that to the prosecutor because okay. that's what they told us that they would need them there for. So basically, you're, you're putting these numbers and presenting these numbers based solely on what this prosecuting attorney's office has decided that uh, they need and, and you're just uh, applying fi figures to what they tell you they want the figures to be, right? Uh, no, that's incorrect. The figures are taken from the GSA and uh, that's where we got the amounts and I'm applying those to what the prosecution says the needs are uh, for them and uh, to have at this trial in, if it goes to Ada County. Okay. How many officers, sworn officers, do you have in your department? I have uh, 32, 33. Okay. okay. And does that include the jail staff to watch the jail? I, we don't cover the jail. That's the okay. sheriff's That's office. That's the sheriff's office. I'm sorry, you're correct. Okay. So you have 32 officers in the city of Mexico? Right? 33. 33 officers. Which includes myself and my assistant chief. Okay. All right. So 29 officers other than you and the chief, right? That's correct. How many of the officers were involved in this case as witnesses? Uh, so we've got the four, five, six detectives, seven, seven detectives. Um, a couple of them have retired. Um, I have uh, my evidence uh, sergeant, sergeant that works with evidence that's involved in that. Um, and then uh, we have patrol officers that, uh, you know, were you know, at crime scenes, guarding crime scenes, different things like that. But uh, the main f part of it has been the detective division that's done the investigation and the uh, crime scenes and those type of things. Okay. Now you realize this case has been going on a long time, right? Yes. And in the beginning of the case, were you asked by Sheriff Humphreys to help provide security around this courtroom uh, several months, several, almost a year or so ago? Um, I don't remember that. Okay, you don't remember having Rexburg police officers here for, for, for a, a preliminary I don't, I, and arraignment? I, I, I know I've had officers here for testimony, but uh, I don't, I can't remember on the uh, so providing recall, security. You don't recall whether they did or not, correct? That's correct. So, you may not agree with me, but it seems that, um, you know, and I'm, I'm only basing this on my 30 years of experience of doing this, but I, I'm having difficulty grasping this idea that your seven officers need to be there every single day, and, and that they can't be called in for a, a, a single day, and they're not gonna be involved in the case every day, are they? Uh, objection. Compound question. All right, but I'll clean it up a little bit. Mr. Pryor, hold on. When there's an objection, I make a ruling, and I will sustain the objection. I think that's also been asked and answered, so move on to something else, Mr. Pryor. All right. You're not suggesting that um, every one of your seven officers is going to be involved in the case every day for 10 weeks, are you? Uh, no, I'm suggesting that uh, we're going to have uh, four, four of them, at least, that will be there for 10 weeks. Well, I, but they're not going to be involved testifying every single day, are they? That I don't know of. Okay. That's going to that's going to be up to the prosecution and yourself. Okay. And then we go on to the five weeks for the three individuals. Uh, do you know who those three individuals are? Um, for the five weeks, it's Chuck Consitus. I think it's Nicole Earl, and uh, I would have to look at. I'd have to refer to the uh, witness list for those three. So in other words, for a five week period, those three witnesses, and, and granted, um, I've had an opportunity to go all over all the discovery, and mm -hmm. I've looked at the case, and, um, and I assume they have as well. And again, I find it um, 
a bit excessive that you're suggesting that these three officers need to be there for five weeks. Are, again, are these three officers going to be testifying every day for five weeks? And I believe I would have to answer that the same way in that uh, that's going to be up to the prosecution and yourself. And, and, and you have good communication with the prosecuting attorney, correct? Yeah. And if the prosecuting attorney was able to call you up on a day and say, uh, we, need officer, we need Officer K here, and I'm using K because if I try to pronounce his name, I'm going to be brutalized by my friends over there. But um, <laughs> Officer K, uh, we need him to testify tomorrow. You can say, okay, we'll send him over, he'll testify, and if he needs to stay an extra day, he can do that, right? If they said and that they just need him for one day, that's what I could do. Right, and if he needs- But I'd have to cover the, the day before, so because of the distance. Okay, and you have 32 off, 29 officers to do that, right? Uh, no, I, I don't understand that question. Okay, well, and if they have questions for Officer K, I assume he has a uh, phone that he can be called on and have him answer any questions, correct? If the court allows that. No, I'm talking about... Are you, are the pro are you talking about the prosecution? I'm talking about the prosecuting. The prosecuting attorney has some questions for Officer K during the five weeks that you want him there. Rather than having him there for five weeks, can he pick up the phone and call Officer K and say, hey, we have some questions about this. Could you answer these? You know, I think that would be uh, difficult uh, in this case because involving the evidence, um, I think that uh, they're going to have to be going over and through the evidence, uh, looking at it, uh, solely, and I don't think that's something that uh, really can be done over the phone. Oh, well, I agree with you to some extent, but um, the first time they talk to Officer K is not going to be when he shows up at court for five Objection, Your Honor. I think we've gotten pretty far afield. The questions are compound, they're long narratives, and they border on improper argument. I'll sustain the objection. Mr. Pryor, just please get to the facts here that have been proposed by the witness, if you would. I'm trying to get to the facts, and I'm having difficulty in trying to figure out why Officer K needs to be there for five weeks, Judge. All right, that's my ruling, and I understand the line of your questioning and questioning whether that's necessary, so if you're okay. moving well, along. Officer, you would agree with me that uh, there's going to be some trial preparation before this trial starts, correct? That's correct. And you would agree with me that you, you work very closely with this prosecutor's office, and at the time prior to the trial, they're going to be going over the evidence with Officer K before he even gets on the stand. You agree with me, right? Yes. So they're going to have a lot of these issues hashed out prior to any witness gets on the, gets on the stand, correct? Well, in my experience, you try to work out as many of those things as you can, but there is always the things that you didn't plan for. Right. And, uh, right. and that may be, uh, as the trial's going and you uh, you have brought up something and then the prosecutor needs to sit down with those individuals concerning that stuff uh, at the trial. So, And that means that that witness would have to come out and work through that with the, uh, um, with the, with the prosecuting attorney when an issue such as that comes up, correct? Um, that is correct. Okay. So in other words, to be on the safe side, we're just going to say, let's pay $17,000 to have these three witnesses there because we don't know if something's going to come up, but you know, sure, just in case, let's, let's spend Fremont, or excuse me, Madison County's $17,000 to have them on standby just in case we need them, even though we know we may not need them, right? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's correct. I think uh, because of these witnesses and what their involvement is with the case, that their testimony, uh, their testimonies may take uh, a very lengthy time uh, at at this uh, trial. Uh, so, yeah. and and I would imagine then that Officer K's testimony is going to take five weeks. Well, as, as I've seen some of the stuff that's come through on this, um, I know on that. Yeah, there could be a possibility that one officer could be testifying for weeks and weeks on, yeah. on one aspect of, of their investigation into this. Is that what the prosecution has told you? No, that is that is me saying that. Okay, so if I, if I say that 
there's, an, there's, an, there's a witness from your office that may be on for weeks and weeks for testimony. Well, three witnesses, that's 15 weeks. We better set this trial out for another three or four months then, right? Your, Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object. It's improperly argumentative. It's called for speculation. And, it, and this line of questioning has gone way afar field in terms of relevance. All right, I'm going to sustain that. I think we are beyond the bounds of relevance here, Mr. Pryor. So please move on to another subject. Then we get to the last one, uh, the $40,425. Uh, you, said, you said that these were witnesses that weren't necessarily witnesses uh, that are police officers. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. So who are these witnesses, these 35? Uh, I thought they are those involved with the case, uh, family members, uh, witnesses, that uh, friends, uh, people that uh, have interacted with the Day Bells, people that have uh, given information. It's, it's a like normal witnesses. Outside of law enforcement. So we haven't defined who these 35 witnesses are, correct? Um, no, they defined it. We have the names of all 35 of those, yes. Okay. And who made the determination that these 35 witnesses that aren't involved as law enforcement personnel need to be there? Uh, that would have been with our detective division and the prosecution. So if I understand. Investigators. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to be better at not interrupting you. Are you done? <laughs> So according to the prosecutor and your detectives, you've determined that there are 35 people in this case that need to show up for at least a week and be present for the trial, correct? That's correct. And you've included that in the police budget, even though it's not a police officer uh, uh, staff, correct? That's correct. So it's really not appropriate for you to, 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 to list those because those are witnesses that should be handled under another scenario, right? Well, I don't know if it's inappropriate, but uh, that's what I've been asked by the prosecution to present oh. those. So in other words, uh, every single one of these 35 people have to be present for, an, for some five days uh, during this trial, correct? That's my understanding. And each one of these 35 people are going to be testifying for a week? Uh, that again is up to the prosecution and yourself. Well, if we have 35 people for one week. I mean, I don't know how long you're good. I don't know exactly how long each one will have to testify as far as in a day or an hour or what. But uh, so prosecutors ask them to be there for a week. Okay. So in other words, we have a $40,000 expenditure that the prosecutor thinks we need to spend to have these 35 people there for a week, even though we may not even use them. Is that fair? Uh, that I cannot answer as far as that we may not use them because, uh, and that's going to be up to the prosecutor whether they're going to use them, but that's what the prosecutor has stated that they need. Well, this is, this is where I'm having some difficulty. And okay. please, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to, to berate you or badger you, but I find, I find it difficult that you're getting up here and testifying as an expert as to what these costs are. And and correct me if I'm wrong as I go through this, but the 10 week cost for those individuals, uh, the seven individuals that you need to bring, you don't know whether they're gonna be necessary to be, you don't know whether or not they're necessary for the 10 weeks, do you? Objection, compound, um, and at least depending on which part of that question, it's been asked and answered. Sustained, it's been asked and answered, Mr. Pryor. You don't know how many of the witnesses for the one week period are going to be necessary for the entire week, do you? I know that that's what the prosecution has said, that they are going to need those witnesses there for the one week period. Okay. And for the five week period, you don't know how long they need to be there? As well. be the same, same answer to that. Okay. So for all of these witnesses, the purpose of them is to, the purpose of having all of these witnesses for these three extended periods is simply to uh, determine whether or not the prosecutor may need to talk to them during the trial but let's have them there anyway. Would that be fair? Um, I believe that that is, no, I don't think that's fair. I think it's that okay. the prosecutor's determined that these are people that they're going to need to have to testify. And uh, that that's the length that they need them there because they don't know when they're going to need to be called back or put on or how long their stay is going to be uh, as far as on the stands. Do each and every one of your police officers have a cell phone? 
Yes, they do. Are they, are they required to carry that with them as part of their duties? Yes. Is that a 24 hour, seven day a week responsibility? No. Okay, can, can you order them during the duration of the trial to be available for the prosecution by phone if necessary? I can. Can you order them if necessary to get on to carry a laptop or a computer and be available by Zoom or other technology to communicate with these officers and the prosecutor if necessary? I can, but then I also have to pay them overtime for all that. Okay. That well, 24 can, hours, that would be a time and a half overtime. Well, I'm not saying they have to be there for 24 hours. I'm suggesting that because we're not going to have a trial 24 hours. You, you, uh, well, you, you know that, right? Objection. You just asked me uh, Objection. It's a compound question. Um, it is a compound question, Mr. Okay. Pryor, so you got to give him one question to answer so we don't run Would it be of that. possible to provide the prosecutor the times these officers are working during that 10 week period? Yes. Would it be possible to set up Zoom technology or face to face technology during the hours that these officers are working so the prosecuting attorney can communicate with them? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. And if necessary, you can accommodate having police officers travel, if necessary, and one of these emergencies comes up, to go to Boise to testify if necessary, correct? I would say that's correct, except for the ones that need to, that the prosecutors identified as needing to be there. Okay, well what I'm, and those are the ones I'm talking about, yeah. So, we I- We can make accommodations to allow for significant communication with all of these witnesses, uh, without the necessity of having them there and pay these exorbitant prices. Objection, well. your, your Honor. I, I recognize the court gives latitude, but this has been asked and answered numerous times. That hasn't been asked, Judge. Uh, I'll overrule that objection. You can answer. Technology would allow significant communication during this trial with any witnesses the prosecutor deems necessary, correct? Um, it will allow some uh, communication, yes. All right, but it's, thank you. It may be like what we just experienced today. Yeah. yeah, and I understand how that happens all the time, right? Yep. Right? That's right. And we can fix that hopefully in about five minutes, right? I don't know. Okay, and I don't either, right? You don't either. No. Right. Nothing else, Judge. All right, any redirect, Ms. Smith? Very briefly, these costs that we've put um, in the projection and is outlined in States Exhibit 3, um, those are if the entire, the entire trial is transferred to Ada County, correct? That's correct. And so the 35 people um, are um, people who are local to Madison County or Fremont County, correct? Correct. And they would not have to travel otherwise? That's correct. And um, just so that we're clear, it, it's a four and a half to five hour drive, depending on how fast you drive, to Boise. It's about a four hour drive. Right, and so if the court has someone recalled, they can't just get there quickly. No. Okay. Um, yeah. And so these are these are budget projections, correct? That's correct. All right. It's an estimate to get the court into a ballpark of what this could cost. That's absolutely right. Okay. And and then this is. Um, your analysis of um, sort of projected cost to both Madison County and Rexburg PD. That's correct. One moment, please, Your Honor. Thank you, and I have nothing further. All right, any recross, Mr. Pryor? No, I think I'm fine, Judge, thank you. Very well, that'll conclude your testimony then, Chief Terman, you can go ahead and step down from the witness thank box. You, Your Honor. May he be excused, Your Honor? No objection. Very well, you can be excused as well. We will next go back to Lieutenant Ruby from Boise, I believe, now is back available, we'll check. All right, Lieutenant Ruby, can you hear me okay? Yes, Your Honor, I apologize for that earlier. Apologies to the court and the court officers. That's fine, it happens. So 
We were still in direct examination, and I think getting towards the end, but in direct examination. Uh, we will continue then back with the testimony of Lieutenant Ruby. Mr. Ruby, you're still under oath for purposes of your testimony. Ms. Smith, if you have additional questions, go ahead. Um, yes, briefly, we, I think we were at the line of questioning about sequestration. Um, do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and just so that I'm clear, do you have any idea what the costs um, to aid a county would be for sequestering the jury in specific dollar amounts? Not in specific dollar amounts. I only have the hourly rate of our employees. Okay. For, and that would be for overtime purposes. And so matter the link, no matter how long the jury is sequestered, that cost of um, beyond the work day will be passed on to Fremont County. Yes. Okay. Now, um, in terms of sequestration, um, uh, when was the last time there was a sequestered case in Ada County? Um, I did some research into this, and, and unfortunately, I'm not able to pro provide a definite answer. Uh, there's some, the jury commissioner believes it was approximately eight years ago, uh, but he was not the commissioner at that time, and, and he doesn't have specific information about that case. Okay. So any of the staff that you have working for you, have any of them worked on a sequestered case before? Not to my direct knowledge. I do have one deputy marshal who's been in the service for 21 or 23 years. Um, he, he would have had opportunity. I can, I can confirm that with him. Um, but other than that, no, I don't know of any staff that's performed on a sequestered jury. And in terms of supervising security and media issues, when was the last time there was a televised trial in Ada County? Uh, other, other than COVID, which with Zoom and closed links, um, I was not able to identify anyone who knew of a trial uh, that was uh, live stream, streamed uh, through television networks. Nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Pryor, I realize having taken this witness back out of order that uh, it may be time to refresh your recollection on direct. If you're ready to go ahead with the cross at this time, you may. If you'd like to take a brief break to review your notes, you can do that. Judge, I think I'm fine if we can go forward. All right. Let's go ahead and go with your cross examination then, Mr. Pryor. Mr. Ruby, please make sure to indicate if you're having difficulty hearing. Uh, Mr. Pryor on cross-examination, and Mr. Pryor, I think it helps if you do speak right into the mic, so go ahead. Lieutenant, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine, sir. Now, we spoke a couple of times previously. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And in full disclosure, um, we covered the topics on your uh, um, email that you sent to uh, Ms. Smith and Sheriff Humphreys, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to go over that. Do you have a copy of that in front of you? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what I understand and, and what we talked about is that um, for court security and a bailiff services, Ada County is not going to charge Fremont County for those services. Is that correct? Anything that happens during our normal business hours, normal procedure, that is correct. Okay. And I want to go on the basis that there is not a sequestered jury, okay? Now, without a sequestered jury, uh, your experience is that the trial started a certain time and ended a certain time, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that is what you're talking about being covered uh, as part of Ada County, just taking the cost and absorbing that cost, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So if the jury is not sequestered, then there would be no additional cost for the jury, correct? Uh, unless um, anything goes after hours or starts early. At this point, we don't know whether that would happen or not, correct? Yes, sir. But Fremont County will not have to bring a bailiff or security to Ada County, correct? No, we will provide uh, court security and court bailiff functions and now, uh, within the Ada County Courthouse. Both of us are uh, very familiar with Ada County Courthouse. Uh, maybe you don't know how long I've been doing this. I guess we do know each other, but uh, we're both very familiar with the Ada County Courthouse. And as part of that familiarity, uh, Ada County is designed to provide significant security for jurors. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? 
as far as as far as uh, where they would park, where they would be brought in, that sort of thing. Well, I, in keeping um, you know security nature um, privileged, uh, we have the ability to ensure um, jurors can enter and exit the building um, uh, with respect to outside uh, media um, as discreetly as possible. Um, so that that movement, we have facilitated that before in in, in other circumstances. Um, as far as within the courthouse, and there they would be in a secured area um, when outside of the courtroom in one of our jury rooms. Um, and then as far as parking and things of that nature, uh, you know, I'm in the planning stages of what that would look like um, to ensure the integrity of, of the trial and, and any of the proceedings. So if I understand correctly, and, and um my experience over there is that the jurors have the ability to be uh, uh, brought in, kept in a secure facility where they park and have access to their cars without being influenced by outside influences, and you can maintain that security as part of the design of the Ada County Courthouse. Is that correct? We will do everything we can to ensure that that happens. There are open areas as far as driving in and out, uh, but we will make every effort to maintain the integrity of the jurors and the alternate jurors and um, throughout the process. As part of maintaining that uh, integrity, you do have the ability to make sure that, uh, for the most part, no one's going to be able to contact jurors as they leave or, and show up at the courthouse and park their vehicles, correct? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the Fremont County Courthouse at all? I am not. Okay. You haven't been out here and see what sort of uh, parking they have here, right? No, sir. Okay. Now, uh, that's not going to cost Fremont County any more for them to have this, uh, this, for lack of a better word, private parking for the jurors, correct? Uh, as far as I know, from, from my end, from the court security end, uh, we have no intention of charging for inmate move, or um, I apologize, for juror movement. Okay. All right. And that's for a, a, juror, a jury that's not sequestered, correct? Yes, sir. Now you put on your, your notation that you sent to Sheriff Humphreys, uh, jail housing $80 per inmate per day. Is that what you're gonna charge Fremont County? Yes, sir. Did you talk to Sheriff Humphreys about what his costs are per inmate per day while, while Mr. Daybell and Ms. Fallow were here? Um, I sent him this email. Um, and I know, I know we've talked a couple times. I, I can't remember if we specifically discussed these costs. Um, I, I don't believe I, I spoke to him since I sent the email. But he didn't tell you what his average day for, for, for keeping a juror in, or keeping a juror, keeping a, uh, an inmate in his jail is on a daily basis, right? No, I can't speak to that. Okay, did he talk about his concerns that Fremont County is gonna be involved in a construction project shortly? Objection, calls for hearsay. No, it doesn't. I'm asking whether or not that was discussed. I'm not asking what he said. I'm asking whether it was discussed, the, the upcoming construction project in the Fremont County Jail. Objection, relevance, and beyond the scope of this witness's information. It's overruled. If you have that information, not specifically what was said, but whether or not there was a discussion. Was there a discussion about the upcoming construction project on the Fremont County Jail? No. Okay. Inmate movement is what's next on your list. To and from the Ada County Jail, Nada County Courthouse. You're not going to charge them for, for busing, juror, busing inmates to and from the, the jail, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. And just for clarity, from the courthouse to the jail. Courthouse to the jail. From the jail to the courthouse. That, that falls under my normal daily functions uh, for my, my transport supervisors. So there's no intention to seek reimbursement for those services. Okay. Now I'm going to jump around. I'm going to jump around a little bit, and I want to cover another area um, that, that's causing me some concern. Uh, I would represent to you that Miss Mace, the clerk, testified that she objection improper to ask a witness to comment on another witness's testimony. I'm not asking him to comment, Judge. I'm asking him to consider. Well, go ahead. It's overruled at this point. So go ahead. In the event there are 16 to 18 jurors in a sequestered situation. Uh, and let's say that's in Ada County. You estimated that as a, at a minimum, you would need three deputies uh, 
per eight hour shift, correct? Uh, correct, three deputies on, on shift at all times. Okay, and that would be for how many jurors? Uh, I, I was projecting uh, 12 jurors and I believe, I believe four alternates, so 16 jurors. Okay. Um, that allows me to uh, staff to keep to maintain the integrity of the jurors while they're sequestered in that location, um, but also provide breaks and relief uh, for the deputies while they're on shift. Okay. And is that a minimum or is that the number? That's the minimum. Again, I'm in the early stages of planning this um, and, and trying to identify other jurisdictions who have handled um, similar type uh, profile cases and to identify what best worked for them and, and things that they uh, would have liked to have done. So based on your experience, uh, you're saying it would need to be a minimum of three, three deputies per eight hour period. And, and if my math is correct, that would be nine to nine or more deputies in a 24 hour period who would need to provide security for a jury. Is that correct? Um, possibly. Uh, some of our deputies do work 12 hour shifts. Um, so I, I mean, the, the hours are going to be the same. The cost per hour is, is going to be the same, whether it's an eight-hour shift or an extended shift. And those, juror, those jurors, whether the case is in Fremont County or whether the case is in Ada County, that's your estimate that uh, if we're going to sequester a jury, we're going to have to have the necessary staff to provide security. And whether it's an eight-hour shift or a 12-hour shift, it could be 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, deputies every single day who are going to need to provide security for a sequestered jury, correct? Yes. Right. In addition to that, um, if it's a sequestered jury, regardless of location, are you going to be needing additional security staff above and beyond uh, um, what you normally have at Ada County, or do you anticipate that the security that you have is sufficient? Um, I'm, are you referring to my court security staff or the Ada County Sheriff's Office as a whole? Well, I'm talking about the court security staff. Is what you have in place now sufficient to handle this trial for, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of security for, for all involved? I'll need to use uh, Ada County Sheriff's deputies who are not assigned to the court security team to assist in uh, after hours coverage. Okay. In order, and, and that's so that I can continue to maintain um, the other court functions of the, or the other security functions and bailiffing functions for the Ada County Courthouse during this, uh, these proceedings. And that would apply in any county though, correct? I, I can't speak for other counties. I can only speak for our county and, and what I'm able to provide with my team. And as far as deputy costs and sergeant costs, there's no indication that there will be overtime. That's just there in case there is overtime, correct? Uh, the, that's, those are the costs that uh, Sheriff Clifford uh, indicated that he would seek reimbursement for is those overtime costs. So if I understand correctly, as a matter of uh, uh, reviewing, Ada County is going to pick up the tab for a, a trial in terms of security costs unless there's overtime involved or additional uh, costs that are not planned. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, um, yes, where anything during normal, any normal business functions um, fall under my purview and I, I would cover it for this proceeding or a different proceeding. Um, and so that's normal costs. We're not gonna seek reimbursement, um, just the overtime rates, any, any costs incurred from overtime. And the only difference is if this judge decides to sequester the jury, there would be cost in Ada County for sequestration. But if the case gets, well, you, if you can speak to this, that's fine. But if the case gets moved to Fremont County, we're going to have the sequestration cost no matter what, correct? I, I, again, I can't speak for Fremont County, but I can only speak for Ada County and, and what we would need to cover. Um, I, I would assume, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to assume, sir. Okay. But you would Sorry. you would understand that if a jury is brought to a to a county from Ada County and required to live in a hotel for ten weeks, uh, that there would have to be some security detail and a significant security detail while that jury was sequestered in a different county. You'd agree with that, correct? Um, yes. All right. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Redirect. No, Judge. Thank you.
All right, thank you for your uh, appearances, Lieutenant Ruby. That will conclude your testimony then. You can go ahead and log off. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, my apologies for the technology. I appreciate the court's patience. Sure. Thank you for your appearance. All right, let me inquire of the court reporter here. You want to take a break for a minute? I can keep going, yes. Why don't we take a 10 minute break here, take a recess, let him catch his breath? All right, let me inquire of the court reporter here. You want to take a break for a minute? I can keep going, yes. Why don't we take a 10 minute break here, take a recess, let him catch his breath? And I understand we've got at least one more witness. Is that correct? Thank you, please be seated. All right, we'll go back on the record. This is case CR 22211623, State versus Chad Guy Daybell. We took a mid-morning break. Uh, Ms. Smith, do you have another witness to call? Yes, Sheriff Humphreys, Your Honor. Very well. Sheriff Humphreys, if you would please step forward, pause, and raise your right hand. I'll have the clerk place you under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the pending cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. You can be seated in the witness box there, and once he's situated, you can inquire counsel. I forgot to move my mic. Good morning. Could you state your name and occupation for the record, please? My name is Len Humphreys. I'm the Fremont County Sheriff. How long have you been the Fremont County Sheriff? This is my 13th year. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, I've worked in law enforcement for 30 years. Um, I achieved uh, basic, intermediate, advanced certificates, and in 2013, uh, earned my uh, executive certificate through Idaho Post. Okay. And what's, what does that mean? Executive certificate, that means that's typically um, certification that is uh, for sheriffs, uh, chiefs, that means lots of hours of training, uh, years of experience on the job. Um, and so um, let me ask, what are the duties of a sheriff um, in Idaho? So <clears throat> uh, besides uh, law enforcement, patrol, search and rescue, we also take care of the jails. Uh, we're responsible for courtroom security. Um, okay. That's pretty much. When you say law enforcement, does that include investigations into criminal behavior, in suspected criminal behavior inside the jurisdiction of Fremont County? It does. Okay. And specifically in the Daybell case, did the investigators from Fremont County um, ultimately report to you? Yes, they do. Um, and are you personally responsible for planning and budgeting for the Fremont County Sheriff's Office's expenses um, attributable to the Daybell case? Uh, yes, I am. <clears throat> We're going through our budget process currently. Okay. Um, now, did you um, do any research on what a change of venue to Ada County would cost your office um, on the Daybell case? Uh, yes, we did. Okay, what research did you do? Well, <clears throat> um, we received a request for an estimate of what it would cost us. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have a lot to go on, and so our first estimate was a what I considered a worst case scenario. Uh, if we had to provide security for the courtroom, if we had to provide security for the jurors, if we had to do everything, uh, like as if we were here. and. Uh, since that time, we received information from Ada County that most of those things would not apply. And so our original estimate was way off. Okay. And the original estimate, had you had a brief conversation with the sheriff in Ada County? Uh, I have spoken with him a couple of times and uh, also have spoken with uh, Lieutenant Ruby on a couple of occasions. And initially, was the sheriff able to give you any like idea of what he would have absorbed and what you had to do? Not originally. Okay. And then sometime after March 1st, you got different information? Uh, just as recently as last week. Okay. And like specifically last Tuesday? Yes. 
and last Tuesday was the first numbers you got out of Ada County. That's correct. Okay. Um, and we've heard that testimony, so I'm not going to ask you to go down that road, but I am going to ask you, um, uh, if the Ada County Sheriff decides to bill um, Fremont County, are you obligated to pay that bill? Well, probably so, but typically that would probably run from commissioners to commissioners. Okay. Um, and so while the sheriff can absorb cost, in the end, the commissioners can choose to bill. That's a question I'm not sure about. Okay. So, um, and so did you initially put together an estimate that is now way off? That's correct. And so we've withdrawn that estimate. All right. Now, um, do you have a final answer from the Ada County Sheriff's Office about what costs are going to be to Fremont County for a complete change of venue? Well, I wouldn't say that they were entirely complete. Uh, I know that there's some questions about sequestering a jury uh, and who would take care of that. I know that their numbers for uh, overtime costs are significant and uh, looking at them, it would probably be cheaper for us to provide that team for taking care of a jury. And so is that a conversation that's ongoing between your office and the sheriff in Ada County? It really is. It's premature to even know which way that will go at this point. Okay. Um, and so when we're talking about these costs to Ada County, we're not talking, um, let, me, let me rephrase, I apologize. Um, the numbers that have been given to the court in terms of the cost from Ada County, that would be in addition to the normal cost of the Daybell trial to Fremont County. Yes. Okay. Um, so sort of switching gears a bit, there's been some talk about um, sort of handling of a trial like the Daybell case in Fremont County. Um, do you, as the sheriff, have concerns about your department and Fremont County's ability to handle the Daybell trial? No. Why not? We have great people who work here. They are very familiar with the process and procedures, um, well-trained, well-experienced. We have sufficient staff to deal with it. It would be a strain on us in some areas, but we do have the personnel here who are capable and willing and able to do it. And so speaking of that, have you had experience in having to say have secure parking for jurors? Yes, we have done that in the past. Okay. And um, without getting into, I don't want to get too much into operational details because that undermines security, but were there arrangements made for, say, the grand jurors to park securely and get to the courthouse undisturbed by media? Yes, we have done that in the past. We've done that for jurors. We've done that for prosecutors. We've done that for defense attorneys. And um, do you have sort of plans on how you keep the courthouse um, secure and um, keep witnesses secure? We do. And do you have methods and entrances to allow people to come and go securely if need be? Yes, we do. Um, now, you mentioned a, a potential strain um, here. Would it be more of a strain if the trial is over in Ada County? Yes. Why? Well, because I'll have personnel who are not here that normally would be doing their normal jobs. They would be in Ada County, <laughs> therefore not available to do their normal jobs. Okay. So, um, for example, um, you had detectives that were primary investigators uh, um, on, especially into the investigation into the death of Tammy Daybell, correct? That's correct. Um, and are they part of your detective unit? Yes, we have three detectives. Two of them, uh, as well as my lieutenant, were very involved with the investigation of Tammy Daybell. And so if they were to be gone for 10 to five weeks, um, um, or even having to be available, um, with what sort of impact would that have on your department and your detective bureau? Well, that would leave one detective to cover everything, um, which 
it makes things a little busy for him. Okay. Um, and uh, can we are we safe to assume there'd be overtime costs? Very likely. But we can't. Project. There's no way to judge that. Okay. Um, and if the trial were, if the jury were picked in Ada County, but back to um, Fremont County, what, if any, impact would that have on your manpower? Well, in one aspect, it would help our manpower. We would still need to provide security for the uh, jury, which would involve um, several officers every day. But since they live here, uh, they'd be able to go home off shift and... Uh, that would be easier for us to do than over there. When you say off shift, could you stagger shifts to accommodate the sequestration? Well, we can, and we usually work 12 hour shifts. And so that rotation would, uh, would be fairly easy to work out. Okay. Um, and so if the trial were here in terms of sequestra sequestration cost to the sheriff's office, could you accommodate it with your existing resources? Yes. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Pryor, cross-examination. Good morning, officer. Good morning, Sheriff. Uh, how much experience do you have in handling a, a jury that's been sequestered? Um, not very much. Well, not very much or none at all. We've had a couple of juries, but they were just during del uh, deliberation after the uh, sentence was provided. And what we are talking about is sequestering a jury for possibly 10 weeks. You understand that, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I noticed today when I came in that there are a number of police officers here today. Uh, you have a significant amount of your police force in this courthouse right now, don't you? I have several deputies here, yes. Well, it's more than several deputies. You have the vast majority of your police force in this, around this courtroom right now, don't you? Probably about half. Okay. Now, you noted that it would be easier for your uh, deputies if the trial was here, correct? Yes. Okay. How easy would it be for a jury of for, uh, 16 people to sit in a hotel for 10 weeks? I couldn't speak to that. Now, we would also need to provide security around the courthouse during this trial. You would agree that um, the tone has been elevated in this community, right? This has drawn a lot of interest. And there's been some anger, right? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. Well, there's a reason why you have, uh, you know, half, I counted, but my number may be different than yours, but uh, a significant amount of your police officers are here today for a hearing. Uh, you would. You would agree with me that when the trial takes place for 10 weeks, you're still going to have to have a significant number of your police officers at the courthouse, correct? Yes. Okay. And if you do do 12-hour shifts, have you looked at the idea of how many shifts you're going to need for a jury being sequestered for 10 weeks uh, and, the sh and the manpower that that's going to involve in Fremont County? We have looked at some of those numbers, yes. And you've calculated out uh, 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. That's what we run all of the time. But in addition to having your security staff here, you're also going to have to staff a separate staff of people who are going to watch uh, the jurors 24 hours a day for 10 weeks, right? We will provide that service as needed. Now, there are no hotels in, well, I guess there's one hotel in St. Anthony, right? There's one. Yeah. Is that going to be sufficient to house 16 to 18 jurors? Um, that will be up to the courts to decide where they house them. Okay. And again, uh, you don't have any input about providing security in Rexburg or Idaho Falls? I expect that I would have some input, yes. Okay. And, and as part of your input, would you prefer Rexburg or Idaho Falls? I think Rexburg has facilities that would be adequate for what right. we need. There's about six hotels. Uh, you're going to be able to plan with the uh, hotel to rent out the entire hotel for sequestering a jury? That'll be up to the courts to make those arrangements. 
And as far as providing security for these jurors, you're going to be responsible for providing them with, at least with some uh, social activities as well during the time that they're locked up for 10 weeks? I haven't discussed that. Okay. And you haven't discussed, uh, well, let's put it this way. How many officers a day do you anticipate are going to be needed to provide uh, security services for 18 jurors during the trial on a daily basis? Um, with 12 hour shifts, we would need at least six officers. Okay. At least, right? Every day? Every day. How many sworn officers do you have? Um, with the jail staff and uh, patrol, we are at uh, about 21. Okay. How many are at the jail? Nine. That leaves uh, 12 officers, right? No, we have more than 12. I'm sorry. I've got 15 patrol deputies, three detectives, two school resource officers, a marine deputy, as well as a uh, uh, recreational officer. So will my count 22. And um, you said that today there are half of your, your staff here today. So we'll be 22, we have 10 or 11 officers here today, correct? Yes. And then the remaining 10 would be completely responsible for providing security at the, um, for the jury, right? In rotating 12 hour shifts? We would rotate th through, and there's other agencies that I can call upon to help us. And that would cause additional costs, right? Uh, very likely. They wouldn't do that out of the kindness of their heart, correct? No. But you haven't looked at that, correct? Not yet. And you haven't put together a plan as to whether or not, in the event there's some sort of uh, uh, disturbance, uh, because it's, gonna, it's not going to be difficult for, a, uh, for some of these folks out here to find out where the jurors are. Small, small community, right? It is a small community. And but we do, have, we do have plans that we've already discussed. Okay. So, so we have six hotels in Rexburg. It's not going to take a rocket scientist to figure out which one of these hotels the jurors are going to be at, right? I wouldn't speak to that. Right. But you're going to bust them from Rexburg or Idaho Falls every day, there and back, as part of the security cost of this case, correct? Yes. And you're going to have to feed them, correct? That's correct. And you're going to have to provide them entertainment, is that correct? That is an area that we haven't talked about. Okay, and you're going to have to take away their communications and cell phones and anything that would potentially cause them some sort of uh, ability to, to look into some of the facts of this case, right? You have to do that as well, right? I will do whatever the judge asks us to do. Okay. And in the event there's some sort of vigil or protest or something like that, have you taken consideration as to whether or not in Rexburg, Idaho, with the six hotels, that in the event there's some sort of vigil or other disturbance where the jurors are being housed, do you, have, do you have plans for addressing that concern if that should happen? There's a lot of things that can happen and we've addressed many of them, many of them yet to be addressed. And but you would agree with me that- Objection, he needs to be allowed to answer yeah. his question. He wasn't finished with his answer there, Mr. Pryor, oh, so- sorry. Um, A lot of things we don't know about yet, it's too premature to even begin to guess, but a lot of it has been talked about. But frankly, we can't really put a thumb on what the costs are because we really don't know. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we, we just can't uh, predict. You would agree with that, right? A lot of it is unknown. Right. Judge, I have nothing else. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. Any redirect? Very briefly. Um, it, um, in Fremont County, it's a very large county, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. There's also resorts and bed and breakfast and recreational properties um, in and around Fremont County. Many of them. Okay, and there's, there's been no approaches of anybody, but that is an option that Fremont County would explore as well for the jurors. I believe that's correct. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. All right, thank you on that very limited redirect. Any recross, Mr. Pryor? So what you're suggesting then is that we're gonna put these jurors in a resort for 10 weeks just to make it comfortable for them? Is that what we're talking about? I didn't make that suggestion. I said those are available. Okay. And you would have the security to shut down a resort so that jurors wouldn't have any uh, uh, contact with outside influences 
uh, while they're deciding what to do in this case? Is would probably be easier, to... probably be easier there than at a hotel. And as far as cost, you've read uh, Lieutenant Travis Ruby's, um, he's, for all practical purposes, anything within the normal realm of a trial in Ada County is going to be covered completely by Ada County. You understand that, right? Yes, I do. All right, nothing else, Judge. Thank you. All right, thanks. That will conclude your testimony then, Sheriff Humphreys. Thank you for appearing today. Do you have any further witnesses to call? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Pryor, does the defense have witnesses to call for this hearing today? No, Judge, nothing. Thank you. All right. Well, if that concludes submission of testimony evidence, counsel, do you want to present closing arguments on the matter, or do you want to submit a written closing argument? I'll leave it to the discretion of the parties. Before we do a brief closing argument, could the state request, I believe we discussed it in chambers, that Mr. Archibald address Ms. Vallow's um, request for change of venue. The state had originally asked for a continuance of today's hearing, not because we needed more time, but because we really wanted a complete record with regard to Ms. Vallow's change of venue motion. I know he's here today. I know that Mr. Pryor made representations in his objection to our continuance motions, and I think to, um, avoid any allegations long-term of ineffective assistance of counsel that somehow he, Mr. Archibald, failed to raise it in a timely manner, it would be, a, we would request and, and suggest to the court that's appropriate that he speak to uh, Ms. Vallow's change of venue motion, whether they want to be heard um, at this time. All right, well, I, that's a matter that is outside of the scope of the noticed hearing for today. I will allow it, but I'm only gonna do that at the total conclusion of the hearing. So if there's a closing argument or okay. statement to be made, you can do that at this time, and I'll let the state do that first. Mr. Pryor, do you uh, prefer to have a oral closing argument, or do you wanna submit something in writing? Judge, my preference is to uh, present a oral closing arguments. So I think the court needs to make a decision and make a decision very quickly given the short time frame we have for the trial in this case. Very well. I'll hear closings then from the state first and then Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Your Honor. The state recognizes that the court's in a very difficult position, and we really appreciate the opportunity to present the economic impact. The people of Fremont County and Madison County, since this is a joint prosecution, have a, an interest in having the crimes that occur within their jurisdiction heard in that jurisdiction. And the Idaho legislature and the courts have developed a method that allows the court to achieve both the ability of Mr. Daybell to have a fair and impartial jury and the jurisdictions that have an interest in the crimes that occur there to hear those cases. And that's under Idaho Code 19-1816. We would ask you to follow it. The state has met those standards. We've shown you that it's more economical to try the case in the county of origin than it is to try it you know, 300 miles or 200 plus miles across the state. Now, are some of the numbers budget projections? Absolutely, but as the court is well aware, trials are not scripted. We can't come in and tell you it's gonna take exactly this long and it's gonna take exactly this minutes, and we can't tell you that this particular detective is only gonna testify once. We can plan, we work for every contingencies, but trials are not a play that we can write out and hand to the court. What we have to do is plan for contingencies. We have to have witnesses available. And when the judge turns to us as prosecutors and says, call your next witness, that next witness better be there. And having the trial 200 plus miles away puts us in a position where we have to make these people who normally we could pick up the phone and say, get here in 10 minutes. Like we can't do that if it's across the state in Ada. We have to be able to present our case the way we need to present it, and that means having essential witnesses who worked on an investigation for going on two years now available to us. I am very confident that if a judge has a jury sitting there for a trial of 10 weeks, jury selection of an additional two, and he turns to us and says, hey, call your next witness, there's not gonna be a lot of time given, and I understand that, to get somebody across the state. So we have had to have some of the primary detectives 
on call. And thank goodness those agencies, Madison County Sheriff, the Rexburg PD, the um, Sheriff for Fremont County, all of those offices had said, yes, you get what you need to do this case right. And if that means we pull people across the state and have them sit there so that we don't inconvenience the court, so we don't slow down the juries, then that's what we'll do and we'll plan for that budget. When we're planning our budget, we're planning it so that we can move this case forward and get justice for these victims. That does doesn't mean we can ask the court to have people drive across the set and wait on us. And so some of those projections are so that those people can be available when needed, so that as issues pop up, they can investigate them. And you can't have that done on the fly by someone who doesn't know the case. So as we're putting together our budget projections, we're putting together how to put the best case forward to the court wherever we try it. Understanding that, understanding that we need detectives who know the case, who know the evidence, available to us quickly, that is easier to do if it's tried in Fremont or in the alternative Madison County. If the court were to allow us to try the case there, people could sleep in their own bed, the departments wouldn't have overtime, the, the defendants could stay in the jail they are in right now, Lori Vallow would have access to both of her counsel, Trying it in Fremont County is the best thing all around, especially considering the economic impact. The court has decided that it's fair to Mr. Daybell and therefore Ms. Vallow that we pick a jury for somewhere else. I understand that and respect that, but the court now has the ability to say, okay, I will allow the state to try the case in a way that doesn't cost the people in this area an exorbitant amount above and beyond what they've already invested. You have the opportunity to allow the people here to hear their case. The other piece that I want to point out, that there's no constitutional right to try your case in a particular courthouse. The constitutional right is to have the people hearing your case be fair and impartial. The constitutional right is to have a jury of your peers who can judge you based on the evidence presented in that courtroom only. It has nothing to do whether you get to pick a pretty courthouse or one that tries a lot of murder cases. It has to do with you need to be in the place where you committed the crime with people who can be fair and impartial. And the court has the ability to do that. Well, the, the people, Ms. Smith, the people that will be picking are the jurors, and the jurors will be from Ada County. Correct. So it sounds like you're arguing that the people from here should be the ones listening to and deciding the case. I apologize. I was being, if, if that's true, that was, I, I was saying the court has accomplished by picking a fair and impartial jury from Ada. Now we're asking you to bring those people from Ada here to let the evidence in this jurisdiction uh, be heard from the place it was collected. This is where those people died. This is where those people were killed and buried. This is where the trial needs to be. And the agencies involved have worked out an amazing partnership. They've worked really closely together. They've dedicated scores of hours of resources. Those people should be allowed to be able to work and do their normal job and be available to the prosecution in the state when we need them. And the best way to accomplish that is to do that here in the Fremont County Courthouse. You know, it's, we've all traveled, you know, I know the courts traveled to Ada County. I've traveled to Ada County, see that courthouse. The fact that a courthouse might be prettier or technically bigger isn't what the, com what the statute contemplates. The fact that more murders happen in Ada County isn't what the statute contemplates. Under that standard, every murder case should get transferred to Ada. This isn't about where is, what courthouse is prettier, who has more staff. This is about can we deliver Mr. Daybell's constitutional rights, Mrs. Daybell's constitutional rights, and allow the people in the jurisdiction that help do the investigation to hear the case. And you have the tools to do that, and we're asking you to do that. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. And I'll just note for the record, I actually think this is a prettier courthouse than Ada County's, and I'm not going to take <laughs> County deciding, I and I mean that sincerely, but Understood. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to present your closing, you may. Judge, uh, I think um, Ms. Smith misunderstands the standard. This court made a decision regarding venue. Uh, I don't have to remind the court the voluminous nature of the exhibits that I submitted to the court. They were voluminous, and there was a... There were, there was quite a bit of media attention. There were vigils. 
there were there were at the very courthouse where she wants to have the trial now in Madison. That courthouse and the commissioners allowed ribbons to be put up on courthouse property until I had a hearing and suddenly and ironically right after that hearing Madison County pulls down all of the advertising on there and the lady across the street said uh, judge I'm gonna have to object he's assuming and arguing facts not in evidence well, and there's no evidence that that's true there's been nothing presented as to that mr. Pryor so just stick with the facts of this hearing please well I guess when she was talking about the pretty nature of Ada County I don't remember that testimony either judge but that's okay we'll move on judge the uh, memorandum decision you issued in this case talks about the nature and the, the level of intensity that's surrounding this case. And Mr. Daybell is entitled to a fair and impartial trial. And that fair and impartial trial just doesn't mean that when he shows up, because all of the deputies happen to be here, that, um, that the jury uh, gets to listen to it and everything goes as, as planned and there's no problems with the jury, the, the process and everything else. Fair and impartial also means that when the jurors being sequestered for 10 weeks in a hotel in Rexburg, Idaho, that they're not subjected to some unnecessary media attention or unnecessary vigils or unnecessary protests or anything else. And given the magnitude, and all my exhibits have been admitted, Judge, they've been admitted in this case, and the court can go back and review it and review your memorandum decision about how much attention was drawn here. And if anyone shows up where the jurors are being sequestered, and that's not going to be a big secret, Judge, it's going to be real easy to figure out. And there's protest, and there's influence, and there's manipulation, and there's difficulties with that. We're going to be right back again doing this all over again. And that's not fair. That's not impartial. The other concern is this, Judge. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a citizen of Ada County. Now, I'm, I'm obviously not going to be picked as a juror in this case. But if I was picked for a jury duty, and someone told me that, yeah, we're going to pick a jury in Ada County, and by the way, after we're done picking you, and whether you're selected and you like it or not, you're now going to be transported to Fremont County, away from your family. We're going to take away your phones. We're going to take away access and communication. We're going to take away everything involved and we're gonna lock you up in a hotel for 10 weeks, and you're gonna to listen to testimony, and the rest of the time you're gonna be in the hotel with, you can't have TV, that would, be un, that would be undue influence. You can't have your phone, that would be undue influence. You can't have anything. And whether it's a resort in Fremont County, or whether it's a hotel in Rexburg, you are taking 16 to 18 people from the community in Ada County, and you are locking them up in a hotel because of a jury trial. Now, I submitted a memorandum to the court, and I addressed in that memorandum the concerns that come about as a result of those situations. And jurors that have a tendency to come to judgment very quickly when they are put in that situation. This case is not about turning 16 to 18 jurors into prisoners in a hotel in Rexburg, Idaho for 10 weeks. This is about a fair and impartial trial. And I'm sorry, Ms. Smith and Ms. Blake, that, the, that this, this county has to pay all of these costs. It wasn't my decision to seek the death penalty. It was their decision. And they made that decision, taking into account what was going to transpire. And this court, and rightfully so, moved venue to Ada County. Now, I, I, I get, at least from my perspective, Judge, some of the costs that they have uh, addressed here seem a bit inflated. But it doesn't matter what the costs are. It doesn't make any difference what the costs are. Because that's not what the consideration is. Costs are only one factor. And Ms. Smith seems to suggest that cost is the entire factor, Judge, for flipping this thing. And that's not what the standard is. The standard is whether or not Mr. Daybell gets a fair and impartial trial. That's where you start. The inconveniences to everybody else. I'm going to have to travel over here. And when I get co-counsel, he's going to have to travel over here. And granted, Mr. Archibald and, and his co-counsel will be able to see Ms. Fallow whenever he wants over here. But when I'm over there with Mr. Daybell and my co-counsel, I'll be able to see Mr. Daybell. So you know, it's basically the same thing. But you can't take consideration of cost. I'm sorry Fremont County has to pay this. If they are upset about the cost, 
then go to these prosecutors and say, why did you seek the death penalty? Why did you do it in this case? And knowing that this was going to be an exorbitant expense. And I'm sorry it's an exorbitant expense. But when you're having a case like this, of this magnitude, and frankly, Judge, this, this is a huge case. There are people from all over the country here. Some of the faces I recognize, but they're not here because this is a regular case. They're here because this is a high profile case. And in the court's own words, when you, when you cited it in a couple of your memorandums, death is different. The magnitude of this case warrants that we take every step necessary to ensure that there's no bias towards the jury, that the jury is not manipulated in any way, and Mr. Daybell, Chad gets an opportunity to present his case without all of those outside factors. And I can't fathom how they would not have an impact on the jury when you lock them up for 10 weeks, people from Ada County. I can't fathom how there isn't going to be a vigil or there isn't going to be some sort of protest or anything else, given the, the, the exhibits that I previously submitted when they lock them up in this hotel. And I don't agree with any of the numbers they presented. Frankly, I think they're padding all of them. And I think, you know, I think it's just a situation where they want, to, they want to be comfortable. And I'm sorry they're uncomfortable, but we're all going to be uncomfortable. And at this, at this point, Judge, the magnitude of this case, the seriousness of this case, and I understand it, it's an expense. And, and, you know, Judge, but you have to look at, we've all been, we've all been sworn in as lawyers. And the primary responsibility is not the cost of things. The primary objective of all of us is the administration of justice. I have a job to do, the prosecutor has a job to do. But more importantly, Judge, you have a job to do. And unfortunately, that may be a situation where you're gonna have to say, I'm sorry, Fremont County, but this is the magnitude of this case is so serious. The magnitude of this case is, is you know, it's one of the biggest cases in the country. And I think to be on the safe side, even though I'm, as a judge, you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the cost, but given the magnitude of the case, we have to have it in Ada County because we cannot afford to have to go through this again. And that is a concern because if there is a problem and there is a difficulty, we're going through this again. And given that, Judge, I would respectfully ask that this court deny their motion. It makes far more sense to not impose such a, a significant burden on, on jurors and risk manipulation or some sort of intimidation or otherwise on a jury when you bring them here in a small community. I would respectfully ask this court to deny their motion. All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. The matter will be considered submitted and I'll take it under advisement for issuance of a written ruling. At this time, there's one additional issue we'll bring up then, uh, as was previously noted by the prosecution Mr. Archibald, uh, if you'd like to come forward, I do want to address the issue as it relates to your case and your client. I'll just note on the record here, uh, there's a co-companion case, CR 22, 21, 16, 24, which is State versus Lori Noreen Allo Daybell. That case is scheduled for an arraignment to take place a little later this afternoon. Uh, the case has been stayed. As I just mentioned, she hasn't been arraigned yet. So procedurally, however, there was a motion to sever that was filed by previous counsel, not by you, Mr. Archibald. The court has issued some rulings in that case and this case that would indicate the trials to be combined in one single trial for both defendants. That's the current posture of both cases. Uh, this issue then, Mr. Archibald, I don't know if you've had enough time to consult with your client. Uh, this matter could be heard independently in your case. You certainly have that right. And I don't know if your client has any position to take on a argument for or against the state's request to transport a jury from Ada County to Fremont County for purposes of trial. So if you are willing and ready to address that issue at this time, you can do so on the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vallow Daybell and I have reviewed the decision that came out in October of 2021. We reviewed that decision both in the mental hospital 
and we've reviewed it since she has been sent back from the mental hospital to the local jail. She is in agreement and has been uh, since I have uh, met and consulted with her with the court's decision in October that venue is proper in Ada County, that the jury should be selected in Ada County, and that the trial should be held in Ada County. The motion to transport the jury back to Fremont County, I have also discussed with her that motion. She is of the opinion that the court's initial decision in October was correct, that the, the uh, jury selection and the trial should be in Boise. On page 10 of the court's decision, uh, my client and I believe that the court previously addressed this, that the court addressed the courthouse facilities, the required personnel, courtroom availability, uh, multi-week high-profile case, ability to house and transport in custody defendants, control of citizen and media attendance, jury security and accommodations, uh, that we have talked about that and reviewed that. We believe the court's decision is correct. And so we, uh, as far as our change of venue, we believe that our motion was granted, even though our case was stayed at the time. Uh, the motion to transport the jury, we would ask the court to deny that, that the jury should be kept in Ada County. Whether or not they're sequestered during the entire trial or just during jury deliberations, that question uh, has not, it is not ripe yet. I would note, uh, this is about my 30th homicide case that I've worked on. I have uh, tried cases in this courtroom. I have gone to Boise and selected a jury and brought them back. And my experience is that uh, when juries are sequestered during trial, it's not a pleasant experience. Um, and so uh, I still may uh, constitutionally be required to ask for the jury sequestration, but in my uh, experience, uh, bringing them to Fremont County in the middle of winter is a bad idea. I've been here in jury trials while it's in the winter. I've been here in trials in January and February. And I've been here when the schools close and the roads close. And uh, that, that there's a reason that this area is so popular with winter recreationists because it snows a lot here. So to have a high profile case but uh, extending multiple weeks in Fremont County, Idaho, where it's guaranteed to snow and snow and snow some more in January and February of 2023 would, in my opinion, uh, not be wise. I agree uh, that the uh, state in bringing the death penalty, uh, it guarantees additional costs that are not required during a homicide case where the death penalty is not sought. I have tried both death penalty cases and I've tried murder cases where the death penalty is not sought. And I can attest to the added burden and the added costs for both the state and the defense when the death penalty is sought. The board dire process is longer, the trial's longer, the sentencing is longer. The appeals are longer. The scrutiny from the appellate courts are longer when the death penalty is sought. So with the capital murder case, if the state is so concerned about money, the remedy is simple. Don't file the death penalty. If they choose to file the death penalty, they got to be ready to pay for it. And they got to pay for it. And it's going to cost a lot. So with the government in control of whether the death penalty is sought or not sought, then uh, they have elected that they're going to spend that money. Half of the states now in our union 
do not seek the death penalty. And the reason is, one of the reasons is because of the exorbitant costs and the endless appeals associated with these cases. Therefore, Your Honor, I, I respectfully ask the court not to bring the jury from Ada County to Fremont County. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. Uh, and I'll note again, those are comments in the context of uh, your case, which is 22 21 16 24. Uh, the court will take this all under advisement. And what I will expect then, Mr. Archibald, is based on your comments today, I wouldn't expect we'll be going through another uh, contested hearing on this issue where uh, it appears you have uh, made your statement as it relates to this. Uh, again, uh, your case has been stayed, has not been arraigned yet, so to the extent this seems somewhat out of order, I'll also note that this is limited on the sole issue of the state's motion today, which is a reconsideration of an order that we would not transport a jury. So that's what the court's considering, and the question of whether or not a jury would be sequestered is not yet determined by the court. So I appreciate your comments today. That will conclude the hearing then. The court will take this issue under advisement. We'll issue a written ruling in due course. At this time then, uh, I will leave the bench. Uh, the defendant will be transported from the courtroom. I'd ask those in attendance to remain seated until such time as the marshals of the courtroom advise you that it's okay to stand up and exit the courtroom and will be in recess.